All right, we're live. This is episode 257 of my live of my live stream. Um, I'm Joshua Kimball. I've been an art director uh, for eight years. Um, I've been a graphic designer and illustrator for over 20. And um, I am when I'm not art directing or working on graphic design and illustration, I am uh, like off work, clocked out, and then I clock back in to work on graphic novels uh, that are usually like indie. Uh, comics. So if you're like really into like raw Art Spiegelman, Chris Ware, um, Adrian Tomine, that kind of stuff. Um, that's the sort of realm of comics that I tend to work in. Um, I am uh, I have two graphic novels that I've written and illustrated that are out and available for purchase. One of them's two stories, which is a comic, uh, 125 page uh, graphic novel that um, is handwritten, hand lettered, hand inked, and uh, is a comic that tries to destigmatize hard conversations about mental illness. Uh, I feel like in this culture, like people really dodge heavy conversations about heavy topics. Like I'll even say the S word, <laughs> that heavy topics like suicide, um, heavy topics like uh, depression and panic disorder. And that comic is a really confessional very personal story of mine that uh, talks really openly about my learning to navigate those things um, and some of the hardest points in my life. Um, and it's a two volume uh, graphic novel and volume one is the one that's completed. Volume two is kind of pending because I uh, got a book deal for another book that I'm working on right now, but volume two will be done. Um, I have it all roughed out. I have the script finished. Um, so really, and, and I think I'm about like 30 pages or something like that into that book, but that had to be put on pause for the current book. Um, but anyhow, you can pick up volume one uh, today. So please do that, especially if you enjoy these streams. Um, and then there's Jacob's Apartment, which is a slice of life coming of age story about Jacob and Sarah, who are roommates that um, are sort of going through tumultuous times in their early 20s. Um, Jacob has recently lost his, uh, well, is losing his father to cancer and questioning his identity and his faith. And Sarah is, um, sort of reeling from a broken relationship in her past. And as they're going through these kind of identity shifting, um, events, um, they find themselves drawn together. And as they're drawn together, uh, their dreams and reality start kind of interweaving in a doomed romance comic that's uh, somewhat tragic but hopefully effective like snapshot of life and young love. Um, and that's Jacob's apartment. So the, both of those books are available. Um, feel free to uh, pick those up to support me and also to read some cool books. Um, so today I am not working on super exciting stuff, but I think it'll be exciting for cartoonists, um, especially people trying to learn a little bit or glean a little bit about the, about my process. Um, today I have, to work on. Let me double check the page. I'm so far in, <laughs> into this book um, that I'm forgetting pages. Okay, uh, page 73 of um, Not Death But Love, The Strange Supernatural Story of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And by the way, as I'm talking, I got a new mic. I've, I've mentioned this a few times. I'm not saying that as a brag. I'm actually saying that uh, because I'm still kind of learning how to adjust the volumes just right. And so if you're noticing that the volume is like peaking or anything like that, as you're listening to this, uh, we have like a live chat and you can just let me know um, and I'll kind of adjust the volume accordingly. And I figure as a team, we can get this thing dialed in so that hopefully it sounds uh, aesthetically nice um, to your ears, because like half of video is the audio. And uh, I appreciate you guys hung me hung in there with me um, when I had kind of mediocre mics in the past as I was building this. I kind of approach most things in life like with kind of a punk rock sensibility. So it's, it's more of like a, if I have a project in mind, I'll do the project and then I'll get the tools as I need them. Um, but if if I have like, you know, a Sharpie and a freaking, you know, <laughs> napkin and that's all I have to work with and I want to make a book, I'm going to make a book with the Sharpie and the napkin. Um, and I've always had that kind of uh, mentality, but uh, but I appreciate you guys dealing with my metaphorical Sharpie and napkin that has been this stream for a long time. Um, <laughs> that's a fair point. Christopher Runciman, uh, who is a brilliant uh, artist uh, in his own right. He uh, does a, a 
different comic page a day, one page comics based on prompts provided for, from people on his uh, live streams. And I tuned in a little bit today to his live stream. I, I didn't end up catching it um, live. I, I listened to a bit of it um, at work uh, about like 15 minutes after because I was dealing with like a lot of art direction stuff. And it's funny because when you're an art director, like half the time you're actually having to do design and corrections and you're kind of handling like different um, files and issues that come up with the printers. And like it's a it's a really like you're juggling like 50,000 things <laughs> in a day. Um, and that was one of those days where like a, a lot of those tasks, like the design tasks, you can totally listen to like podcasts and stuff like that. But when you're in meetings and you're like calling factories and like doing all this other stuff, like you're just kind of running around doing things. And uh, there's no way I was going to be able to listen to the live one. But anyhow. Um, oh, and Adam said, I hit the like button early every time. Thank you for reminding me. That's one thing I've been trying to get better at. Um, as I'm on this little live streaming journey, hit the like button. Um, if you're watching right now, um, just go ahead and pause for a second and hit it because you'll, you'll probably have the intention to do it or go, hmm, maybe I should do that. I do this all the time when I'm listening to a, um, a live stream and then I'll forget to hit like. So don't forget to hit it because you want to support indie creators and that's a really good way to do it. Just hit that like button. It's free. It takes you two seconds and, uh, and we'll get into the content in a second. Oh, anyhow, I didn't read Christopher's comment. So he said, I meant to help to test the microphone if you were to, it would help if you were to sing a happy love song. Or maybe I did read it. I'm pretty tired. So I might have read that before. Um, <laughs> Christopher said, I hit it. Now, how, what about that love song? Oh, you know what? I'll do a love song if somebody sends a super chat of a minimum of $5. I'm, I'll do it for five bucks. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> But otherwise, um, I, honestly, I might do it for free if you hang in there. Um, but that'll be later in the show um, and possibly in a break. Today, we're going to get into like some really interesting stuff. So I'm going to counterbalance the kind of boring comic work that I have to do for Not Death But Love. This is like setup work. And uh, a, a lot of people don't realize the planning that goes into book design. <clears throat> and so um, this will give you a window into like what I do with my pages before even getting to the drawing stage. So I have my roughs completed. What I'm going to be doing tonight is taking those roughs, uh, designing um, uh, my panel borders. Luckily, I have like panel borders that I've already designed for about 72 of the pages. So most of the assets for the borders themselves and like the little Victorian filigree that I'm using um, already exists, which is great um, from previous things that I've had to build. But I'm basically going to do that um, lay out all the panel balloons, like the word balloons and the text. Um, and then I'm going to take that and then draw over it in um, Photoshop so that it has like more of a kind of hand done look. Um, and because I think that makes a massive difference before I even get to like the, the drawing stage um, on the page. But it's like it's kind of tedious, boring work. So that's why I usually don't live stream when I'm doing that. Um, it's not quite like drawing where like when I'm drawing, I'm really focused and I just don't want to like I have a brain that gets easily distracted. So live streaming when doing that's just not not good for me. <laughs> but um, but the uh, the this stage like is just boring. And so that's usually why I wouldn't do a stream during it. Um, it's uh, but then I was realizing like maybe that's not boring for people. Um, I've made this mistake before when I taught uh, at college um, where I would like, especially my first semester ever um, teaching and actually early as a manager too, I'd make this mistake where I would assume somebody already knows something that they don't know. Um, and so I'd like skip forward, which is weird because I'm a very like over explainy guy. Anybody who's been watching the stream probably knows that about me. I'll, I'll go on uh, total tangents, get into things that people already know and I'll just kind of cycle on it because <laughs> I'm like, I want to be thorough and I'd rather be thorough and look like an idiot than be um, uh, too quick and have people lose what I'm saying, which which to me is like my biggest concern. Um, but anyhow, even with that in my personality, I just forget to lean into that because that's actually a real advantage as a, as a teacher <clears throat> is not assuming, like confirming that everybody knows everybody's up to speed and that kind of thing. Otherwise, you end up with students who are falling behind because... You know, when you teach groups of people, guess what? Like 
nobody ever speaks up about something that they're, they're having issues with, uh, partially because of like social pressure and they'll feel like embarrassed for it. So you want to create a culture where they can speak up if they're behind and uh, allow that one brave student to kind of ask the question the whole class is thinking, but didn't have the balls to ask, right? Um, so anyhow, my point in saying that is I was realizing like, oh, I should probably show this process um, because like a lot of people may not find it boring because it's because it's a relatively um, efficient way to kind of set up panel layouts and stuff like that using Adobe Illustrator. Um, coming from an illustration background, I wouldn't really use Ill Illustrator unless I was doing like linear, like uh, airplane diagram kind of work. Um, but um, I use Illustrator all the time at my work for uh, illustrations because the vector lines really help for manufacturing. But uh, but the main reason I do my layouts in Illustrator is my other background, which is in doing a lot of graphic design. And the more you work in graphic design, um, <clears throat> maybe it's snobby of me, but you will hear this a lot from graphic designers for a reason. If you're doing typographic work, you should be using Adobe Illustrator. If you're doing book layout, and you need custom type or type that's going to have like really precise kerning, um, especially like headers and stuff like that. Uh, Illustrator is still a good way to do it and then import a lot of that into InDesign um, where you can like do more plug and play stuff where you have live type, but it's all fixed to a grid and it can kind of auto populate on pages. Um, but uh, when it comes to comics, um, it's like with type, uh, and and borders and like very linear things, it's better to start with Illustrator, even if you're gonna hand do it in Photoshop later or like create like a custom look. I see this error so much in comics where you have these beautiful comics and then they have the worst typography known to man just slapped over beautiful illustrations. And um, it, it's, it's really sad because it actually does more harm than good to even have the panel borders on the, or, or, or like, like it does more harm than good to have really crappy digital looking um, stuff just slapped on beautiful illustrations. So like I always encourage people like level up on your type. And one really good way is get familiar with Adobe Illustrator. Um, uh, but I'm not doing anything super fancy with type. This is just um, <clears throat> laying out this panel. We, we roughed this out on stream. So this is what the rough looks like. Um, and we're going to kind of get into that. So. so all that being said, um, my long intros, this is like 12, we're at 12 minutes. <laughs> um, all that being said, we're going to jump in, but uh, to offset that, because to me, this is more kind of a production kind of uh, area of, of the process of making comic pages. Um, and, and again, like I'm not the fastest artist, so this may not be like the most um, quick way to do things, but for me, this has been a really efficient process. Um, but as we're doing this kind of more production oriented stuff, um, we have the advantage of this is the type of work because most of the text, like if I had to type the text or write the text, it's going to be really problematic for me to listen to something. But the beauty is we have a script and we have a live script. It's a, it's a um, word document. So it's like, I can literally like cut and paste the type in to my layout once I'm doing it. And so what that means is, I can listen to cool stuff while while doing this kind of somewhat production oriented process. So what are we going to listen to together? Um, I was initially thinking, hey, we should listen because I've been on this like neuroscience and philosophy kind of vibe. And I was like, man, it'd be cool to listen to Fred uh, um, Francis Collins because Francis Collins is like the scientist that uh, headed the NIH and uh, helped decode the entire human genome. And he happens to just be like a brilliant lecturer and he's really interesting. And uh, he's also a Christian, which is really interesting too. But he has a really good lecture on just the history of the discoveries that have gone out uh, throughout history of DNA and how those kind of chain up and create these like, uh, um, what is it? Like exponential growth in the field of just like saving lives. And it's like this really just powerful um, lecture that I've watched before. And I was like, that would be fun to do. But then I was realizing, you know what? This is an art channel. Um, and so we should probably stay a little rooted in art occasionally. And so I thought, okay, we could listen to like a cartoonist, that kind of thing. I'm like, well, you know what? There's plenty of channels out there, you know, showing like, 
you know, um, comics will break your heart kid or like all these classic, like uh, cartoonist things. And one thing that, um, uh, Christopher Runciman was saying, Francis Collins, nice. Yes, it would be nice. We'll, we'll I'm going to save that one for another one. We are going to go the art route, but instead of going with a comics person, let's listen to some art theory. <laughs> and I just lost all viewers. <laughs> no, like, um, Art theory is really interesting. Um, it's fascinating. My friend Rick Reese, um, who comes from a really punk rock background, when we were both in grad school together, we used to talk trash on art theory all the time. And what's funny is the same class we used to talk trash on, he ended up teaching like three years later. <laughs> um, and both of us went through a similar journey where um, theory at first, when you dig into it, is kind of like um, philosophy when you first dig into it. Like, there's a lot of BS out there. And, and to be honest, your intuition when you're reading through this stuff isn't always wrong. Like a lot of art theory is really like jumbled nonsense um, masked in like really big words. Um, and so it's like you have like, but then there's other art theory that's like the most compelling stuff ever. And it's, it's just like using big words because that's the words they have to use. Um, uh, and it, it isn't full of like redundancy and nonsense. And so like you kind of, it, when you're first introduced to it um, in a good class, they're going to have you go through all the different arcs of like movements um, leading up to like postmodernism and beyond um, in like theory, for instance, including English theory. And like a lot of the theories that you're going to go through that frustrate you frustrated later theorists who then went back and like talk trash about the same thing. You're like, ah, why do I have to read this? It's such BS. And then there, there's like this um, exchange of ideas that keep feeding each other and start getting more and more interesting, more and more refined, more and more complicated, more and more confusing, but like in the coolest way that can really inform your art. And so um, I think, I, so I was thinking about it and I'm like, there's some heavy theory that we could get into but I was like, no, you know what we should go through is my favorite theorist um, in when I was in grad school. Um, when I was in grad school and I was forced to take all these theory classes and history of art classes and reading these very heavy theories, I came across uh, Air Guitar by Dave Hickey. And it is like when you're bogged in theory and it's really heavy you have this like poetic writing like that just is like, it feels like a jam session, <laughs> like um, about art and about theory and about beauty and truth. And Dave Hickey is one of the best theorists who's ever lived. He's won the MacArthur genius award, but he writes in a fashion where you feel like you're reading like a rolling stone, a rolling, rolling stone, <laughs> no, a rolling stone rock, critic like from like the 70s at the peak of like the best critics of rock and roll like it is flowing and arty the way he's writing so it's fun to read it's poetic it's riffy it's it's like it's he's a, just a great writer but not only that it's very thought provoking and there are heavy theories in it but it's so beautifully easy to digest that to me, when I was bogged in that mire of grad school and having to just like bury myself in like the procession of the simulacra and these like really complicated ideas, some of which I didn't like, some of which when I boiled them down, I was like, this is weird because it's not really saying much new, but it's like treated like it's this new, you know, thing. Um, and and I, but as I've gotten older, I, like my my perception of theory has changed um, quite a lot. I appreciate it a lot more. I can actually understand it a lot more. Um, cause I have like a broad understanding of like the different movements throughout, even if I've forgotten like half the names. Um, so I'm really thankful for having to take the class that I just, I like the classes that I had, I like the ones I hated the most, um, in, as a graduate student, not only that, but learning it helped me justify my art and my choices. And it helped me learn to like think through my process and you'd think like, oh, that's only going to help you like as like some snobby, like high artist selling at like a Miami art fair or something. But no, it's it's actually applicable to commercial artists as well, because it teaches you to defend your work. And guess what you have to do when you're pitching designs or illustrations to clients? 
Um, you have to learn the art of persuasion <laughs> um, and the art of explanation and also uh, the ability to defend your work when needed. And, um, and theory like really helps hedge that. And it helps at least engage the mind for that. So I hope you guys are down for this little uh, journey with me. We're going to watch um, uh, Dave Hickey talk about the God NUI. And I have not watched this lecture. I just, but I would recommend, um, even if this lecture is no good, because I haven't watched it yet. Um, and I'm not even necessarily sure which realm of his theory this one's going to deal with. But um, I recommend to everybody, uh, like if you want like a really good just like book that's like just a breath of fresh air about art, um, Air Guitar is just a classic. It's like it's one of the core, um, especially if you're into rock and roll and you're into geniuses. <laughs> um, it's pretty cool. Um, OK, so that's what we're going to listen to while we work on comics. So let's get to our comic cam. And oh, I should probably mention I'm working on Not Death But Love. The Strange Supernatural Story of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. It's um, a book written by Lavender Vroman that we're creating um, about uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning, um, the famous Victorian poets. Uh, and um, like it's based around the letters of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So it's very, very historically close. Um, you'd be surprised like how much fiction is there. Most of the fiction in the story is just filling gaps. Um, of knowledge that nobody would have an ability to know. Um, but it's about Elizabeth Barrett Browning um, and her delving into the world of the supernatural and spiritualism um, in the form of like seances and readings and all these things that were happening in Victorian England at the time. It's got an area of mysteriousness and she's kind of aiming to like reach out to her brother who passed away in the process of this uh she winds up falling into like a web of kind of intrigue and suspense uh that that potentially threatens um her marriage her uh health because you know she falls into opium addiction and all sorts of crazy stuff um and it's all mostly true <laughs> which is the weird thing is when you read this comic, um, it's just got like a really good vibe to it. Anyhow, I don't have to pitch it yet. Um, I haven't even finished it yet, but that's what I'm going to be working on tonight um, on page 73 of that. So we're getting closer and closer to the halfway point on that graphic novel. Uh, and it's for Turner Publishing. Um, and while we're working on that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get to our art stream so you guys can see. Uh, I already have taken my rough, which I worked on a stream I can't remember, man, I got 257 of these live streams, so I do not remember which one, but um, you'll probably see uh, page 73's, um, <laughs> however well you can see that, you'll probably see this, um, I'm going to put this away too, um, you'll probably see uh, this on the thumbnail if you want to see the process of, uh, of generating this, like drawing this, um, this uh, rough. And so like, I'm going to show you how I use these roughs to polish up pages and then an eventually um, create some cool stuff. Um, and also I'll show you how, like once you have one illustrator page built for your comic, um, you, and you figure out like your line weights for your edges and stuff like that of your uh, panels, this, this can go relatively quickly. So my goal is, get this uh, done in Illustrator, uh, draw over it in Photoshop, and have that file ready uh, for some work tomorrow, um, and listen to Dave Hickey. And then if we manage to get all that done at a reasonable amount of time, I want to play a game of Risk. So that's, that's what's on the agenda right now. There's five people watching. So as we're getting into this, hit that like button. You right there, the person who hasn't, just click it. And we'll get into this. I also, before I get into anything, should um, uh, should delve into this. Um, oh, Adam said, I read Francis Collins' first book. It was great, but it has been a while. And then uh, uh, Vic Du said, Adam, how's that cool I'm screwed <laughs> XD? I have no idea what that means. Um, uh, I think I missed something in the chats. And then we got... Um, 
<laughs> Adam asking Philip uh, how the washer is doing. I don't know if oh Philip's here. Uh oh, nice. Philip said, "I'll hit yours if you hit mine." <laughs> I love it. And then we've got um, we've got Christopher saying, "I can't stay, Josh. Meeting with a client first thing in the AM. Have a great stream." Oh, like, he can't stay. Um. And then also he said, are you sure you don't want to just sing some happy love songs? Kind of do. I just got to think about it. I got to think about what love song I will sneak in. So if you're if you're heading out, uh, Christopher, make sure you watch tomorrow because I, I I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll feel the muse to sing a happy love song. Um, that's not copyright infringement. that will get sued for <laughs> Um I, I could sing happy birthday. I think that's a free song. You know what's weird? I think that actually is in the public domain nowadays, but would that be a really risky thing? Because I don't know if people, I don't know if younger kids realize there was an era in time where like there was a whole crew of people going to like restaurants just suing anyone who sang happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> like it was so like litigious. It was almost like the I heart New York where you, it, like if you use I heart New York, expect like expect New York and um, and uh, oh my gosh, now I'm blanking out. I'm blanking out on. Oh, and Milton Glaser to just come at you like they'll come at you like a pack of wolves. Um, it's known in the industry. That's one of the most litigated designs. Do not ever ever even come close to ripping off that design because you will get raked through the coals and you will owe the city of New York money as well as Milton Glaser's estate, which is not fun. Although I don't know if it's his estate. Oh wait, Milton Glaser, I do believe, I do believe passed away. I can't remember. That's terrible. I know he did. Uh, he was alive at least he might still be, but I know he was alive. Um, in the last season of Mad Men when they convinced him to do uh, a lot of the art for it, which is really cool. Um, but anyhow, uh, now we're, now we're rambling and we're not even at the point of working on art and I'm a, I'm, I got work in the morning. We got to get going. We got to get moving on this stuff. All right, let's do this. Um, while we do it, um, I'll go ahead and pull up the video of the lecture. Um, and this one's called, Dave Hickey, the God NUI, and I have no idea if I'm pronouncing NUI right. That's right. I went to graduate school, and yet I don't know how. I think it's NU. <laughs> NU. But anyhow, I don't know pronunciation, and I still talk like a moron. So, you know, <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, okay, so uh, let's do this. We got um, rough page 73. We're going to turn this into like the first thing I do is like I'll double click and I'll kind of dim this and we're going to kind of work on this while we listen to some Dave Hickey and do commentary on it. Um, hopefully it'll inspire some ideas. If I'm working on like type stuff, though, even if it's cut and paste, that might be the one point where I won't be uh, doing a lot of commentary because <laughs> that is a little hard to talk whilst, whilst doing. Um, reading words and not talking the words you're reading is pretty difficult. Um, Christopher, uh, we already got the Christopher thing, and Adam said goodnight to Christopher. Well, it's too bad he left, because I, I would have probably sung maybe a goodnight song. Um, I was realizing I could do the whole goodnight sweetheart song or whatever, but uh, oh well. Runciman loses again to the Kremlinator. Um, that's his nickname for me. Uh, is the Kremlinator. I prefer just being called Kremble and my followers of minions being called the Kremlin, which, by the way, if you are watching this stream, welcome to the Kremlin. Not Kremlin, Kremlin. That's right. Okay, let's continue. Uh, let's get into this. <clears throat> you know what's weird? I think that this might be, ooh, we might need to reset this up. That was set up for the Francis Collins. Let's do... Um, okay, uh, this will take like three seconds to do. Actually, I think if I just close this one, we'll have it auto populate. Let's see, present share screen. 
and let's see social security number just hit share no i'm just kidding <laughs> um, okay here we go and we have our um dave hickey the god and ui this is uh for the school of visual arts and this was a lecture at least uploaded a year ago um and again like this little like wormhole i've been on recently has been mostly like touching base with theorists and philosophers and thinkers that I've loved, but I just like haven't checked in on in, <laughs> in years. And it, 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 it's a great process to do because it's like awakening a part of my mind that I don't get to exercise a lot. And so it's fun to like do, and hopefully it'll do uh, similar things for you guys. Cause these are very thought provoking people. All right. Um, here we go. <clears throat> oh, um, Christopher said, I can't stay meeting. Oh, wait, sorry. Philip said, it's okay. There's a couple of issues I'm e eating, awaiting oh, to hear back from a company. Um, oh, and that's, that's in regards to the washer. That is awesome. There's been a washer arc with, uh, Philip and Adam and myself. Um, and we've talked about washing machines ad nauseum, including Sonic Youth's washing machine, which is one of the best songs ever written. Well, not Washing Machine. That's one of the best albums, but Diamond C on Washing Machine. Um, so, Philip, hopefully your new Washing Machine is as good as Diamond C by Sonic Youth on their album Washing Machine. Okay, let's continue. Uh, let's Well, let's start. Let's start this business. Um, and I'll stop and occasionally explain what I'm doing. What I'm going to do right now, though, is I'm going to pull open... Uh, before we start, so you'll probably see this as we're kind of getting into it. I'm going to open, so I've double clicked the um, imported Photoshop file, which I imported as flat, even though it's a layered file. And then I've double clicked it and put it as a template at 50%. Locked it. And now what we're going to do is open another previous page and start borrowing assets from it that we've already spent the time to build. So why recreate the wheel and kind of placing them in and adjusting them so that we're making an aesthetically nice page. Um, most of that'll be like importing the, uh, the panel borders um, that I've already previously built and then kind of placing word balloons and starting to plug in the type and play with that a little bit. Um, so that's part one. <clears throat> okay. And while we're doing that, we're going to start, ladies and gentlemen, Dave Hickey. I don't know who's introducing him. I'm imagining a teacher at the, uh, or a professor at the School of Visual Arts. And here we go. By Dave Hickey was an essay titled, Do this? Oh. Chet Baker, A Life in the Arts. And Dave Hickey writes, ah, okay, I think let's... the first thing I read um, by Dave Hickey was an essay titled, Chet Baker, A Life in the Arts. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> Adam said, NUI is pronounced ennui. You see, like I am the least sophisticated person. Um, I'm trying to think what the word was. Uh, like I've always been a heavy reader, but it took me a long time and I'm trying to remember it. Maybe I'll remember it, but there was a common phrase for when you're tired. Um, and, and now I'm blanking out on the phrase, but it's a common word and i mispronounced it for like 10 years and it, at, until i went to college and then i heard somebody use it and i was like oh my gosh that's how it's pronounced because like for the longest time i'd just read it and phonetically you know um sound it out and i had no idea that like the pronunciation was off for like a decade um and it was super embarrassing um i'll remember what it is uh and mention it later okay let's continue Okay, the God on we. Let's continue. And I was pretty much hooked from that point on. Hickey wrote about what Ch Chet Baker uh, represented, but he also wrote about what he made about the music in a Ch way that was absolutely accurate to my experience of it. Also, let me and know, guys, if you can hear the, about the thing we're going to comment the mouth on. Of Lou Reed. The thing you learn is that popular music is easy that the song will play itself. So all you need to do is make it sing a little and not fuck it up. <laughs> By the way, there will Since be language. I've read everything Dave Hickey. Dave Hickey writes and will continue to, not because I agree with everything he says, but because he makes it sing a little. 
Mm. Please welcome Dave Hickey. That's a really good brief intro. Also, I'm sorry about my hair. I'm trying to make some decisions about it. I'm sort of stuck between retired Rhodey and Albert Einstein. I can't <laughs> quite decide how to go. Let me pause here too. I just so you guys know a little bit about Dave Hickey because he didn't mention it. Um, so Dave Hickey, I believe he's um, he might be retired now, or at least just teaching like a few courses. But he was like a tenured lecturer at like I think the uh, University of like Las Vegas, and it's like it, it's it's this um, interesting thing. And he's written a lot of criticism about academia and stuff like that. But that's where he comes from. So Las Vegas is kind of like his turf. <clears throat> just so you know, so. Somebody teaching in Las Vegas can go on to bring, uh, you know, win the MacArthur grant, you know, um, that's, that's insane. So, uh, okay. Um, Adam said the video is a little bit quieter than you on my end. Well, sorry, that might be something I can't fix. Let me see if I have the ability. Yeah. Okay. So that might actually just be an issue. I'll just pull back from the mic a little bit so that, uh, hopefully my comments don't drown it out. Uh, this is a lecture about ennui. Uh, late in the there we go on lecture, I was going to talk about what I call the forty-year rule. So I need to uh, stop here at the first and credit it to Bob Rauschenberg, uh, who first broached the forty-year rules, who argued that art runs in forty-year cycles. And uh, what Bob meant by that was, first of all, once something is forty years old. You can't claim it anymore huh. as a part of the uh, contemporary discourse. And the second thing is, once it's 40 years old, you can also finally steal from it. You understand? And so that is uh, Bob's idea of the 40-year rule. Uh, it applies to economic cycles in the arts. It applies to a, a whole lot of uh, important uh, sequences and why things happen. But I want to start off in talking about boredom, on we, and start off by saying that it's not, not. Okay, guys, sorry to cut him off. I also want to say, just as a, a thing for people who are used to hearing people just talk about art relating to like comics or books, Dave Hickey like critiques everything artistic. Like he'll go from like like what is called by like the high art world, like low art, which he's a big fan of, um, to like high art. Um, and like, so he's, you know, writing for art forum and like all these big, like giant, like theory bu publications that are for like the upper echelon of like art co collectors and stuff like that. Um, and he'll write about like rock bands and all sorts of stuff. So um, just so you know, this probably is going to pertain more to kind of like collectible, like gallery artwork and stuff. But um, I think it's worth listening to because a lot of the thoughts can apply to like anybody kind of making art and trying to make something beautiful. So uh, let's continue. Not a bad thing. Uh, it can become a positive thing if Andy shows you uh, the Empire State Building for 24 hours and then that takes boredom into the level of the sublime. Mm. Uh, but the idea of boredom is a fairly simple idea of uh, quoting my, or uh, paraphrasing my friend, Tim Wilson. Uh, he said that, you know, the, we receive, the, the mind receives and clears information all the time, sensory information, and kind of clears it for conscious uh, awareness and all this stuff comes in. And if anything's wrong. Sorry, let me uh, correct what I've been doing here. I thought that I hadn't, <laughs> this is how many pages I've done. I thought I was working on page 73. I'm actually working on page 74. So we need to re-import. So I opened page 73's text. And then I was like, wait a minute. Why am I doing the text for page 73? We just finished that yesterday. This will show you a little bit how exhausted I am. Um, but you have to kind of like to do a book of this length, you kind of have to be exhausted occasionally. Um, so what we'll do is kind of correct that. Let's actually, that's encouraging because we're a little bit further than I was assuming. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and mark that Photoshop file because that's done. 
And now we're on page 74, which I need to import the, uh, the flat flatten, right? Um, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and double click this um, and lock this. Hopefully you guys can see all this. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and hit template and images, images to 50. So we just did the stuff I had done before stream on the right page instead of the wrong one. Guess what? This happens in art. And I'm going to go ahead and close this out and we'll listen to more Dave Hickey. Okay. Um, or feels weird or feels good. Uh, you know, that is our, uh, our pre pre consciousness reports it to our consciousness in the form of emotion or static or something. And other things, if anything's a little bit weird, <laughs> uh, we find out about it somehow in our heads. And um, the point is, is that boredom then is the absence of all this static. And it's the absence of all of this upset. And as a result, uh, I read a book on the airplane, I can't, not on this airplane, but an airplane, um, by a guy named Horowitz called The Geography of Bliss. And uh, it's one of those books that I wish I had thought up the idea to sell it because this guy flew all over the world trying to decide where people were happiest. You know what I mean? So he got on a plane, stayed in good hotels, went all over trying to find out <laughs> where people were happiest. And it turned out and uh, made me happy that I didn't write the book that uh, by this guy's uh, measure, people were happiest in Switzerland Iceland and Bhutan. And uh, even when Uma Thurman's daddy is not there in Bhutan. Uh, but what he also discovered is that people don't talk about being happy. They talk about being content. And content is sort of positive boredom. Huh. I mean, what else could it be? Uh, we've got the whole middle of America totally devoted to content. They're all just, they're, they're perfectly content. The whole sort of Garrison Keeler universe that divides us from our friends in Los Angeles. Um, it's all about one form of contentment or another. So what are we doing trying to make, make each other anxious? You know, what are we doing running around here trying to make each other upset, overexcited, confused, doing all that sort of things that artists and writers do? What the hell is going on? You know what I mean? Why couldn't we just be content? You know what I mean? Sit on the porch. <laughs> have a cigarette. You know, just be content. Did your mother ever tell you that? My mother was. I just want to also say one of the things that's charming about Dave Hickey, it always has been, is, again, like, this guy's a genius, like, a legit genius. And, like, he talks, like, with no pretension. <laughs> and, like, I love that. I love that there's, like, no air of pretension, even though he's talking about really deep stuff. And you'll see as he goes on. But he just does it so simply and beautifully. Um it, it's it's so simple it's complex i love it so let's, let's continue but hopefully you guys are getting a kick out of that um why can't you just be content my god it's a beautiful day um now the the best theory that i've ever heard about why we can't be content is darwinian theory that my a uh, wonderful old guy from South Carolina named Morse Peckham thought of. And Morse wrote a book called Man's Rage for Chaos. And it was Peckham's idea <laughs> that even though human beings... I have got to pause and highlight. Hello, Jim Lujan. <laughs> hey there, kitten. <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, Jim said, I need to learn this guy's voice. Yeah. And the thing is, again, this is a MacArthur genius. Like it is, do not be fooled <laughs> by his accent. <laughs> um, uh, literally in my opinion, one of the best art theorists out there. And I, I, but he does have a really charming voice. 
it'd be interesting to hear him talking to Werner Herzog. You and Christopher Runciman should do a bit that's that because Christopher does such a good Werner Herzog as we learned, and uh, and you could kill it doing a Dave Hickey. And also his last name's Hickey. That's material, man. All right, let's continue. And individual human beings in cities and countries and towns strive for contentment. The species demands that there be somebody there to deal with things when it gets weird. <laughs> Do you understand? It's like when it all goes weird, somebody's got to jump on the hand grenade. Somebody's got to say, oh, there's tiger out there. Somebody has to sort of confront threats to the species. And since we are certainly the safest species in the world, we developed disjunctive and subliminal ways of doing it. In other words, we develop rhyme so we can feel anxious when it's not there. Hmm. We develop meter so we can feel the anxiety of its collapse. We develop rules of art so we can feel nervous when they are not followed. Do you, do you understand? And this is more society. And the reason we invent these synthetic situations is because eventually somebody's going to have to go out of the cave and deal with tiger. So that art and music and literature become a way of teaching us to deal with discontinuity and anxiety and ecstasy and all of those things that fall into the not content category. Um, then that's theoretically why truth, we're here. Jim, we're here truth. to save the species. I like that, that idea. Uh, that doesn't mean the species likes us very much. Uh, but I have come to feel like and I've rarely ever come to feel like, I've always felt like there were too many artists, but, you know, lately I begin to feel like there's way too many artists. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, just before I left uh, home, I counted up the emails, art announcements on my, uh, on my email for Tuesday, and there were 142 of them, and some of them were group shows, and that's on Tuesday, and that's about regular. Um so it seems like to me there are just so many artists that I have started thinking in categories. And uh, in order, you know, and, and the number of artists, the amount of artists out there that I would like to propose sort of a statistical way of thinking about it. Now, the way this, um, this sort of uh, benison of artists came about uh, really came about in the late 60s when... Um, everybody in America for, for really most of the 20th century tried pretty hard or as hard as they could to kill artists, <laughs> you know, and to destroy them and to embarrass them and to make fun of them and to laugh at them and to make fun of uh, Jackson Pollock as a fool and Andy Warhol as a clown. And, and, you know, they tried to really to make the arts go away. And then when they didn't go away, but the mid 1960s, when it's pretty sure, you know, it's pretty well established that we have a going thing in the art world, and that about 6,000 people have created some of the best art in the 20th century. When they couldn't kill us, they decided to claim us. Huh. Do you understand? Those are our artists. Every one of them. They're all Americans. They're good Americans. We can put their paintings together and send them all over the world. So that's Americans. That Jackson Pollock, that's called all over painting. That's America. We're all over fucking everything. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so all of a sudden, America embraces. So again, like, if you're not charmed at this point, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> like, It's so good. It's so funny. And I mean, like, he's, he's, yeah, he's great. Uh, I mean, let's go deeper again, but um, he's making such a good point, too, because <clears throat> this is something I think about a lot. And this isn't like a lefty take. This is just a take like, OK, so when I lived in Long Beach, there was this weird thing that would happen. And anybody who lives in a city sees this. <clears throat> There'd be this really cool spot everybody who lived in Long Beach knew about. 
<clears throat> and it usually was like an out of the way thing that was on the like on the edge of like the not safe part of town, but it's like kind of on the edge of like the safe part of town. <clears throat> and there'd be something like, oh man, this place opened up. It has like the best tacos in the city or <clears throat> this place opened up. They have like the best art shows in the city or like this place opened up. They have like the best keep going, right? It'll be the coolest, most unique thing in, in the city that like it, it feels like a local thing, not, not a hipster thing, like a local thing where like, if you live in Long Beach, you know, like, Holy moly has fish tacos for like $1, <laughs> three for a dollar or five for a dollar on this one intersection. Right. And everybody in long beach knows it. Everyone there goes to it. Right. But only people in like, if you're visiting long beach, you probably wouldn't know to stop there. Um, or, you know, like that's, that's a silly example. Cause Holy moly, I think might be a chain at this point, but my point is, um, things like that, where it's like, there's things that are like identifiers of like the movement in the city and things that the city likes that are like not high culture stuff. Like they're, they're organic. They kind of grow and then they get adopted. And that's kind of, I, th I feel like a bit of it relates. This is something I think about a lot where it's like artists quite often, like start, you know, making music. That's just like music's a good example too, where they'll make music. That's like really indie, really underground. It's really subversive. It gets made fun of. Nobody cares about it until they do. And then it starts moving and it's all organic movement. That's like, this is a cool thing. This is the thing. Like, this is the thing that we all need to do. Like, it's amazing. And everybody starts, like you start having these scenes build up and it's like very organic and very cool. And then, the suits come in <laughs> and they start paying people millions of dollars to like either like they buy the people who already did it. Right. And then they also start paying people to sound like that sound, like do the Nirvana thing. Right. And then after a while, like all the bands sound like a really bad imitation of Nirvana. Cause like the organic bands all got swallowed up by the machine. And it just kind of is the art cycle where artists like do this innovative thing that has to be accepted because it's awesome. And quite often they're fighting every resistance in the world. And then when it finally gets accepted, <clears throat> like he was kind of alluding to, it gets claimed. And this is something I think about a lot. A lot of people call that like gentrification of a city that tends to happen um, where you have like a really cool bar and suddenly it becomes a yard house, <laughs> you know, with a bunch of jocks, <laughs> like, or, you know what I mean? Like it's, it becomes like the, everything gets made for like a frat guy and all the cool stuff, like just, just gone. Um, or a yuppie, like an old yuppie, you know? So anyhow, um, that I'm guessing is where he's alluding. I, like I said, I haven't seen this lecture, but I love Dave Hickey. And I think that's a really good point. Now let's continue, uh, checking this out. And I hope what I'm doing right now is making sense. So what I'm doing is, now we're adapting, like, I, you'll notice all this type is kind of being plugged and played into there from my script, right? I already have my line weight set for my, um, for my word balloon. So all I have to do are like slight modifications. Um, and if I don't have to, that's great. <laughs> but that's the first kind of quick, but relatively fast part of this. Um, and if you're curious, like how I built these, um, I'll zoom in really carefully. And it's like, all of these are just simple components, right? It's like, that was a little circle tool. This was like a curve drawn with the pen tool and so on. And I wasn't worried about like, if I was making this for final art that was going to be on illustrator, I would go in and like refine these points. So they're a little cleaner, but this is going to be a template that I'm going to work from. So I don't have to be super precise. Um, I just want these to be a little consistent. So I'm repeating this little corner element. I'm keeping the weights between these two lines the same. And I'm trying to keep this gap between my panels the same. So that's kind of what's going on uh, while we're listening to Dave Hickey. But now I want to listen to Dave Hickey a little more because he is way more interesting. <laughs> Um, oh, and we'll probably take a break um, after I finish uh, the vector part of this, um, and then we'll get into the Photoshop part for 
uh, like after the break, probably. Um, okay, let's continue. The arts. And well, if we're going to embrace the arts, we have to support the arts. You know what I mean? And the best way to support the arts, since we're all uh, businessmen, we know that supply side economics is what works. Ooh. And the way you run supply side e economics is you encourage the sources of art. The more sources of art there are, the better odds that there will be good art out there. So all of a sudden, we start encouraging artists. You know, hand over fist. Uh, we have art graduate schools, thousands upon thousands of them. We have art students, hundreds of thousands of them. And it uh, didn't work any better than anything else ever did. But we, and we didn't give any thought to the fact that supply side economics is a murderous and ruthless concept. What it means, we get a million people to try and 900,000 of them go broke. That's supply side economics. But we got Microsoft, or we got what we got. And the idea of the, all of this support for the arts, because America's number one in the arts, and we want America to stay number one in the arts. You know what I mean? <sighs> I can remember when people referred to an American art world, and there may be one, but it's probably in Brussels. Um, but I, um, the problem is by, by, by multiplying the sources, you create a situation in which everybody's going to fail. You, you know what I mean? Hundreds of thousands of people are going to fail. Who is going to make money? Professors are going to make money. <laughs> Real estate people are going to make money. Universities are going to make money. You know, your dad's going to have to pay for it. You're going to pay a quarter of a million dollars for a graduate education. And then you can't go to the beach and smoke dope. You have to work in an apple store. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so so you, you have this, this enormous source of art out there you have all of this art that's that's being produced and 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 who is encouraging you you know well you've got your professor and now your, your professor and i'm one of those professors so <laughs> I, I, I i stand as vulnerable as they do but your professor probably graduated from uh, whatever one graduates from if one is an art professor MFA, something like that, yeah. PhD, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. What's he going to teach you how to make? He's going to teach you how to make an 89 Datsun. <laughs> Do you understand? Because if he could make an 89 Mercedes, he'd be in New York. <laughs> but he can make an 89 Datsun, or if he's a little older, an 85 Datsun. Do you understand? I should have warned you, um, even though Dave Hickey is a professor, he's like one of the most critical people of U.S. institutions. And honestly, I will tell you, like the very professors that he's a critic of, like a lot of them are big fans. Like he's he's very on point with his critiques of academia. And it's kind of like the guy who <laughs> is at a point in his career where he's able to say what a lot of professors want to say, but just can't. And that's kind of like one of the refreshing things about him too. Um, but let's continue. But that's a good point about like, I mean, you know, um, I do remember, you know, being, it depends on the teacher's approach, but I definitely had a few professors. I'm not going to call these ones out, um, especially in like the foundation classes who were like really pushing a style. And um, quite often it was a very like old, outdated style. However, I still learned things from them and gleaned things from them that were valuable. But um, but he's not off point. So let's continue. Stan, and so you're going to come up here into this meat grinder with your 89 Dodsons. Do you understand how suicidal that is? <laughs> You're going to, to destroy all of the money your mother and dad 
have ever put together to buy some dump in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? I mean, that's a, this is just a really terrible idea. And you, you know, and and the thing is, you got all of this support to keep you out there. And the reason you got support is because here in America, we value creativity. Now, let me suggest to you, and I had an experience uh, about a year ago. I was. You know, uh, so let me pause this. Of- I'm, I'm wondering, because Corey talks about this a lot, the value of boredom, and he makes a really compelling case. I wonder if Corey's read Hickey. I don't know if he has, but if he hasn't, I think he'll get a kick out of Dave Hickey. Because uh, I'm guessing that he's kind of heading into that direction, that new direction. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you guys, we are an hour in. We're at the hour mark. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play a trailer for Jacob's apartment and I will come back. We have finished the basic part that I needed to get done tonight. It wasn't that exciting. Wasn't that thrilling? So we have finished the first part one of two things I need to do tonight. So now we have this, we have it saved or we do now. Um, and now what we're going to do, uh, is, is take this to Photoshop and make some stuff happen. So, um, but this is page 74. I'm reminding myself and we'll be right back. Uh, we're commenting on Dave Hickey giving a lecture. Uh, and I've learned new things, um, that, uh, apparently, um, it is called on way, <laughs> the God on way. Um, okay. So we're going to go ahead and play the trailer for Jacob's apartment and we'll come back and make some comics guys. Uh, here we go. Speak clearly and see. So um, before we get back to this lecture, uh, just to kind of justify a little bit of art theory. So my experience in grad school was one of the funnest, like most artistic growth that I've had. And a lot of it came from the fellow students in school. Um, And so like there was like a graduate studio on campus where we would all be working. I've talked about this where we're all working on different things. So you have somebody like sculpting, like in the corner, like working on their master's thesis, like, which is mostly a visual show for your MFA. <clears throat> and there is like this long, boring paper you have to like format in like this stupid, outdated format. Um, and a lot of kind of bells and whistles and stuff. But the core of it is like the growth you make in your own kind of exploration as an artist. Um, two stories kind of came out of that. Um, experience for me because I did life painting. I did all these different things and I realized that like, I really love comics. Like if I, what you end up kind of finding out a lot of the time in grad school is if you weren't being paid, what would you do? Like if you just could do whatever art um, 
was like an expression that was like what you've been chasing as an undergraduate, you're kind of absorbing information. And now it's the time to kind of like take that information and what are you going to do with it? And it kind of trains you on that in a weird way. Um, <clears throat> so for me, one of the most valuable things was having a class where I'd have to read through theory. Some of it I'd hate, but I'd have these ideas kind of sitting in my head. And then I'd have like an art history class and I got like some ideas of art history in my head. And then I'd have like a design class and I'd have like these designs floating in my head. And then I'd go to like my graduate studio and there's like a bunch of people taking classes like this with a bunch of different ideas and theories. And there's there starts to be this like insane discussion of what we're working on. And it's like an open studio. And so it's like we start giving each other ideas like and feeding this. And it creates this like amazing environment of floating ideas um, and and that starts informing your art. So like even approaches I took to two stories were very much informed by like my buddy Rick Reese, who was working on his, you know, graduate degree at the time and like doing these uh, here. Let me let me show you one of his paintings. They're, they're really cool. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have him gift me this, but um, he'd do paintings like this where he's like spray painting um, and drawing cars. Like it's really not the best here. Let me go full cam just to show off his stuff. But uh, so he'd be working on this kind of stuff, but like these giant ones, this is one of his smaller paintings. Uh, and he got in this phase where he was just like really into the idea of cars, like, but, in weird perspectives that you're not used to seeing them like falling and like flying. And, um, and this one's just like oil, but like also this layering, it's crazy. He'd like layer these, like he'd stick on like pieces of paper and stuff like this. And this was like a more simple, um, one of his, and he'd also bring comic elements to it that were like fed by like our, con our, I'm imagining some of our conversations about comics cause he's a huge comic fan. And like, starting to play with like formalism and uh, like um, anyhow, you should look up his stuff online. Rick Reese art, um, really, really good artist. Um, but he was working on this stuff and he would do things like take like a, an existing, you know, image of, um, of like an old advertisement and kind of like <laughs> and lettering and graphic design and all this cool stuff. Um, this is just a small version of what he would do. And he'd be painting on these giant wood panels, you know, and like doing that. And we'd be talking about the theory that we hated so much. And what's funny is in the process of doing that, we start developing what our theory is, right? Because like, it, it, and, and it starts affecting our art. And it's this whole thing where we're like, oh, theory is BS. And in time we're doing that, we're actually creating our own art theory, we're figuring out what we actually want to communicate. And so that's like why art theory is really cool. Even if you disagree with it or even listening to like philosophy, you disagree. Inevitably when you're getting these like different inputs, they start kind of informing or giving you new approaches and new ideas um, to, that you can bring to your art. And it's very inspiring um, or new ideas that you can bring to your art to work against. Like if you hate it, it, it can drive you to like, visually prove why they suck like, <laughs> like um it's just a really cool thing so anyhow let's continue <laughs> but yeah i have that on my wall um along with a lot of other stuff but um but that was a cool one to just kind of show off while while i was talking about rick um and we've had him on art casters i'd encourage you guys to check it out okay let's continue CEOs in Vegas at a, at a convention. And, uh, my job, as it turned out, was tell them to not buy art for investment in, in what they oh, wanted to hear. Oh, we got to go back but, to Visible. Uh, I opened the show for uh, Dick Butkus, the football player. And um, Dick speaks it probably more often to CEOs than I do, and um, way more often. And Dick comes up there and he says, this nation will survive 
on its creativity. <laughs> it'll be it'll be founded and continue on the ability of people like us to create the new world. And my job here is to free your creativity to express itself. Okay. Gee, never heard that before. <laughs> my point here is that creativity is not an art word. You know what I mean? It has to do with obstetrics. It has to do with a whole lot of things. But mostly, it's not an art word. It's a business word. Creativity is a way of multiplying the sources of art, so we make sure we have a good quantity of respectable art, and uh, we don't kill everybody in the process, huh. or quite everybody in the process. So we have this, this whole cult of creativity. Now, how do I know it's a cult of creativity? Because I talk to these people. <laughs> because I'm not a snob or a snot. Well, yeah, but I talk to them anyway. <laughs> uh, I have in the last decade spoken to representatives and groups of representatives of art support systems. Local ones, state ones, national ones, international ones, all support the arts. These would be organizations, foundations, associations, alliances, institutes. And in all of this talking, I have heard mentioned maybe 100,000 artists and about, say, 50 subsets, Korean artists, dyslectic artists, a regional artist, local artist, every kind of artist you can imagine, you know, uh, out of 100,000 so that they all break down to about 50 of the group. Um, and uh. I promise you that in this entire dialogue, not one person has ever mentioned a single work of art. Huh. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Art is not what it's about because art doesn't vote, because art doesn't pay taxes, art doesn't pay tuition, art doesn't do any of the things that we expect of American creativity. You know what I mean? <laughs> it just makes a bunch of Jews a bunch of money. You know I just got to pause so here. Okay, so every time... He says America, like as he's riffing on this American creativity, you know what I mean? Like the, the cadences are so intentional. It's so good. Anyhow, let's continue. So what can we do about this? Uh, but my, my point is without any works of art being mentioned now, Think of all the people you know that belong to the American Art Alliance or the organization of uh, collective people that really want to help the arts or, you know, are the, you know, the Woodmont. The art casters could be added to that list. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Bracy Institute, you know, who really do want to help the arts. Think about all these people and imagine, just think to yourselves, do you think any of these people know anything about art? Huh. No, they don't know shit about art. Yeah. Can they can they can they tell a you know, can they can they tell a Monet, you know, from a Miro? No. Well, Arthur Danto can't do that. So <laughs> um, Arthur, you there? Okay. <laughs> I had a feeling he'd skip. Um Anyway, uh, but my point is, what kind of artists are we encouraging if nobody who's encouraging them knows anything about art except how to make a 79, 89 Dotson? Do you know what I mean? Where is the pool of selection? Mm. Who's deciding this crap? And the way that I came to understand this most profoundly is that... Uh, after running an art gallery and uh, editing an art magazine here in town up until about the early 70s, I decided, eek, and I went to Nashville to write popular music. And so I wrote songs and played in bands and did stuff like that in Nashville. 
uh, where they're, uh, strangely enough, not as well educated, but a lot smarter. Mm. Because it takes more brains to get from Mississippi to Nashville than it does to get from Connecticut to Manhattan. Do hmm. you understand? And so these are extremely intelligent people who have all, all of their education comes off bus station, bus racks, you know, so they know about Edgar Casey and things like that. But uh, my best friend down there was a great songwriter named Billy Joe Shaver. And uh, Billy Joe probably wrote the best hook that's ever been written for a country song. It's called the, the song is called I'm Just an Old Chunk of Coal but I'm going to be a diamond someday. It's pretty good. Uh, but anyway, Billy and I go used to go around and pitch songs to record producers. And we'd go in and we'd play tapes and we'd play them on the guitar and we'd try to sell songs. Now, Billy was selling 10 for my one. <laughs> and I didn't mind because Billy really was 10 times better than I was. But I planned to get better and to learn from this whole thing. And uh, I told him that it didn't bother me because he was 10 times better. And Billy said, Dave, it's not about the quality of the song. That don't matter. They can make a hit out of any piece of crap. Uh, what matters, you see, uh, excuse me, is that it, it doesn't make a difference because one song, like one work of art, varies from another song or work of art in microseconds, instant, infinite, you know, tiny, tiny little variations. And he said, Waylon Jennings and Bobby Bear know a good song from a bad one. Nobody else in this whole town does. So hmm. they're not really doing business with us. What they're doing is trying to make themselves feel good. And how do they make them feel good? Here are you and I in their office playing our guitars. He says, I could take urine and sell them. You could take mine and you couldn't because you got a brownstone on East 50th Street because you speak French. I lost three fingers in a sawmill accident and quit junior high to join the goddamn Navy. Now, you don't have a chance. Up next to me. He said, do you, do you understand? Because what this guy is thinking, will it make me feel good to cut one of Dave's songs? No, because that'll be like he's giving in to all of your intelligence and all of your education and all of your sophistication. That'll be like he's, he's giving in, you know. But if he buys a song from poor old Billy Joe Shaver, who had to quit junior high school, and who had to uh, had three fingers cut off uh, in a sawmill accident, which I should note somewhat impaired Billy's guitar style. Um, <laughs> but it, it, but you know, in a winning and sort of uh, abject way, um, he said, when they buy one of my songs, they felt like they just felt they fed a tramp at the back door. They feel great about themselves. He says, says, you just have to understand that this kind of patronage, this kind of help, depends exactly on the emotional defects of the people who are giving it out. Hmm. In other words, it depends absolutely on what they want. One piece of art, one song, no, no really, uh, no major difference in, in, the, in the larger speck of things. What that means is, is that poor Billy Joe, with the benefit of a uh, junior high school education somehow understood the first principle of Foucault, which is care is control. Care is control. Hmm. Those who care for you control you. So then I think of all of these alliances and all of these organizations and all of these institutes, and they're there to control you. Do you, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? What, for instance, might the Turner Prize be about? Remember every year they have this uh, award they give out in London called the Turner Prize, uh, named for a better painter than anyone they've ever given it to. <laughs> um, 
or maybe it's another Turner altogether. <laughs> Don't get me started there. It's, it's too rich. Um, but, and every year we say, oh, who's going to get the Turner Prize? Or in the literature, who's going to get the Booker Prize? Who's going to get the Turner Prize? Then somebody gets it, and we are shocked and dismayed. You know, I think last year was some kid who runs around from Calvary to Calvary, turning on and off the lights. You know what I mean? I mean, I used to do that when I owned a gallery, you know. And <laughs> it didn't really, you know, it didn't. Really, but what you look at the Turner Prizes over the years and you understand that care is control. All of these awards are designed to keep British art on the steady road of post minimalist conceptualism and to, to keep us from you know, veering too much from things that Nick Sirota doesn't understand. And so the, the Kerner Prize is always there, the Booker Prize is always there to redirect things, to get there. I don't know if the Hugo Boss works, you know, considering the source, but I would imagine that it would. So let us presume then that we have an interesting situation here in which we are supposed to make things that aren't boring. You don't you know, understand what I'm saying. And uh, as the great uh, music producer, Tom Dowd said that the first rule of uh, writing a song is don't bore us, get to the chorus. And uh, <laughs> so in a sense, that, that's, that's, that's all of our jobs. And so what we have in any given moment in the art world is a field of what you would call standard practice. You walk around and look in all of these buildings, see all the moves that are going on. They're all pretty, if you don't notice them, if you have to force yourself to notice them, they're standard practice. And that all of this standard practice is built upon a standard canon. That is the stuff from which it all derives, being Bruce Nauman. And uh, who else? Bruce Nauman. That's him. Poor Bruce, he controls your lives. Uh, uh, that's a responsibility, um, which Bruce couldn't care less about you, I'm sure you. But um, the point is now, how do you make good art in a situation like this? Well, the rule when you're trying not to be boring is that any work of art that perfectly complies to the canon and to standard practice, it's not bad, it's not good, it's not there. Uh. Do you understand? It's just not there. It complies perfectly. It fits right into the groove. You have learned everything. You get an A, Doris, but it's not there. You ever watch, walk through a provincial museum, like the museum up in Worcester, where a lot of my relatives live. I used to go hide there to watch, look at the fake Rembrandts. Um, and uh, you can walk through a provincial museum and walk out and you're not mad. You're not, not happy. You've just seen nothing. Okay, so this is such a good point. It's so interesting. I've talked about this multiple times where it's like one of the things I always felt bad about, you know, is like there are like these methods of teaching that I witnessed, especially when I was teaching, you know, where I'd see some people who were just kind of teaching technique. And so it's like you'd have like all these people who learned how to render like a fish, <laughs> or I usually use like a duck as an example here. And it would be like a perfect rendering of like a picture of a duck. And you could do a gallery show of all of these kids assignments of rendering the same duck. And the really good ones, you if you saw a gallery full of that, <clears throat> like people just rendering a really beautiful image of a duck, photorealistically. You, if you saw that with like a bunch of names underneath, you're not going to go into the gallery and like walk out with anything like he, he's really making a good point here um, because like it's just a, a picture of a duck. Like I'm not I'm not like <clears throat> I have no reason to look at who 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 signed it. 
um, no matter how like profoundly realistic it is, because at the end of the day, if it all is just like replication and good technique, then it's kind of boring. <laughs> um, but I will remember something with like a strong concept. I will remember something with a strong concept drawn with a crayon badly over something with no concept that's beautiful technique. So I wonder if that's where he's going. This is really interesting. You know, it's like you spent the day listening to AM radio. Do you, do you, <laughs> do you understand? You have witnessed full compliance to all of the rules. Oh dear, I did everything right and it still sucketh. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, I lost my little place here. <laughs> Point is, in a Darwinian system, uh, and, and certainly the art world is an extremely Darwinian system, one cannot replicate standard practice one cannot replicate standard canon. Mm. In other words, if it does, it disappears. So everything has to deviate. Another thing, everything that you make has to deviate from standard canon or from standard practice. And the easiest way to do this, as I would recommend it as Rauschenberg represents, is to change the canon, which is to go back about 40 years and find somebody that you really like and steal shit from them because they're, <laughs> they're history now and you can steal shit from them. Uh, this is a process which I have certainly followed and certainly Rauschenberg followed. I love it. And it's called going back to the moment right before it started sucking. <laughs> do you understand? And so what you do as an artist, you go back and you're like in 75 and you look around and you say, Richard Tuttle, and this sucks. I'm going to go back even further, and you get further back, and you get further back, and finally you get back, and you come upon, oh, I don't know, Kandinsky. Wow, Kandinsky rings my bell. You start from there, and you start again. The way you can see this happening, I was saying, I noticed, remembered today, is that this is so good, like in in the sense of just like um a gallery setting but it's actually not a bad advice when it comes to like making um pieces if you want to like really uh like be different be on to something um it, it isn't a bad practice to like dig back and find inspiration because if you just go with like the latest trend and i think that's the bigger point he's getting to my whole rendering a duck thing might have been off topic from what he's getting to it sounds like his point here so far is kind of like the idea that if you're just kind of replicating trends, um, it's like a really skilled guitarist just playing a Jimi Hendrix cover. Now, even then, it's like, you know, if somebody's writing music that sounds like Jimi Hendrix now, that might be interesting. But like if you were doing that at the time and just kind of photocopying Jimi Hendrix, which, by the way, would be really hard to do. But if you were that skilled of a guitarist where you're just photocopying and sounding exactly like them, that's that's really hard to stand out. It's it's really I mean, this is why I like Dave Hickey. He makes really basic points, but like that's not a bad point. Like it's a good thing to consider. Um Didi said, I just painted a realistic pet who has passed away for a commission. I do many of these, and then people cried. They loved it so much. Please don't diss on realism. Oh no, I'm not trashing realism. I was just saying like <clears throat> even that has a meaning, right? Like you're doing it for an intention. And so that's going to have meaning that's going to cause emotion for your client or whatever. Right. Um, I mean, I do a ton of like renderings and stuff for my day job and they have a function, but it's a good point of like, if you're trying to kind of like make a book that has your own kind of like look to it or stands out or something like that. Um, yeah. I mean, like there's a million. So, um, if you kind of mimic only like current trends or rely heavily just on technique alone, um, that can like be tough to like have like a memorable, you know, name attached to the piece, um, which isn't everybody's intention too. like a lot of the time with portraiture, your intention is just to capture the subject because it's meaningful for the person who made the commission, you know, um, 
but yeah, so here let's let's go back to Dave Hickey. I have no problem with realism though. Um, I think most of us learn it, right? Like that's my point is like most artists should learn how to do that. Like there is a point where you should learn how to render a duck. <laughs> Like if you can't do that, that's that could be a problem, especially when you start applying style and like all sorts of other stuff to it. Right. So like doing that as a core thing and knowing your foundations and stuff, it's really essential for your growth. Um, it, it's not a, it's not a bad thing to learn, but just stopping there could be a problem. You know, like that's all just stopping there is like where it's like most I think that might be where I was getting at with the whole duck thing like cool you can render a duck okay what are we gonna say with that that's all you know tim pavington has a show up at jack Chaman. uh when i first met him he was one of my students and uh, he came to class with his dog who's a big shepherd uh named ellsworth by the way hi dd <laughs> so uh ellsworth was his dog then my friend uh, jim iserman from Palm Springs came up and get a lecture and he brought his dog Bridget. So I figured if the young artists that I know are naming their dogs for Ellsworth Kelly and Bridget Raleigh, all of whom are, you know, stand before the, uh, beyond the 40 year limit, then that probably means things are changing a little bit. Now, neither Jim's nor Tim's work looks like Ellsworth or looks like Bridget, but it is informed by them. Oh, that's and so this smart. is one of the interesting things. And so this is so you can sort of redo the canon. You can go back in the past and find stuff you like. When I started writing, I could Okay, I gotta pause here. This is such a genius advice, like really. Um, and uh, outside of just like the high art world, keep in mind, like he's talking about like galleries and stuff like the whole like, you know, like Bergman Station, like the, you know, like all the high art galleries, which I am completely disconnected with. I have a few friends who who roll there, but that's just, I don't know, that would be a life I don't know if I'd enjoy doing like gallery work. And I, here I am making like comics, okay? So like, <laughs> I'm by no means like some snobby like gallery guy. But my point is, it's good advice to like, don't look at just, um, this kind of ties into stuff we talk about with comics all the time where I really love Chris Ware. Um, but when I got into Chris Ware, what I started doing was like looking at who influenced Chris Ware and who influenced those people and who influenced those people. And it, you kind of dig back and you start seeing, Oh, they pulled these elements and stuff like that. So you can have art that's like informed by like an artist that's older, that was informing the art that you were really interested in. Um, and you can pull elements from that. And like the further back you go, like the more interesting it gets. Um, it, this is something I've done for like a long time with like contemporary artists that I, that are in my field. Right. Um, I'll look at them and then be like, who are they looking at? Um, because again, like if I just look at them, it's like mimicking something that might be kind of in vogue right now and gone tomorrow. And again, like relying on trends and stuff is it, it's hard to kind of do that. Um, so anyhow, this is just interesting, but that's really smart. What uh, Hickey's saying here. I had to go back further than 40 years. I had to go back nearly a hundred years before I came upon uh, Victorian reportage. That's because I was what they call a, uh, a new journalist and basically that would be like Tom Wolf and Hunter Thompson and me and uh, Grover Lewis, a lot of people. And new journalism was basically Victorian reportage. It was Dickens to Quincy Hazlitt, all of those people. And that's who we learned from, you know, but we went back to right before it started sucking. <laughs> and so that is one way to do it. Like, so a good example of this is like, one of the things he's talking about, it's it's almost like um, if you like Nirvana, right? And you're in it's the 90s and it's the peak of Nirvana. Maybe it's good to like listen to the Pixies, right? And then go back because the Pixies were an influence on Nirvana. But like, wait, what else was an influence on Nirvana? And you could go all the way back and like a huge influence on Nirvana was the Beatles. <laughs> and it's like, so you might do good to just kind of go and look at the Beatles and then like do your own spin on it and kind of follow a little bit of the threads of the stuff that was inspiring um, Nirvana rather than like riffing 
Um, and especially what he's talking about of like, if you as an artist are like looking around at what is trendy right now and you're like, this all sucks. Like, which is, you know, what he's getting at. Um, you can go back to like the point before it sucked. That's a really good point. <laughs> like be like, man, music today sucks. When was the last time I felt really good about music and look back and go, okay, I really dig this feeling of music or like, you know, in my opinion, like um, this is a weird thing, but it's like, I feel like uh, indie comics are really great right now, but the indie comics I'm looking at are much older than contemporary mini comics or not mini comics. I, am I using the word mini comics? So I am sleepy. But my point is, if I look at most comics today, like I wouldn't say they suck, but like they don't like a lot of comics that are coming out currently stylistically don't speak to me. But I look at comics from like 40 years ago or 50 years ago and like some of the aesthetics and thought that's going into that are things that are more interesting to me than a lot of contemporary comics. So that doesn't mean I'm not excited by contemporary comics, but a lot of the comics I'm excited about today are looking at older techniques and so, um, or older ideas. And so it's like, it's kind of like, I, I don't think there's a lack of truth to what Hickey's getting at here. And by the way, one of my favorite, um, this is just for Didi, but uh, Chuck Close is one of my favorite artists. And if you want to see photo real, <laughs> like before his accident, when he started doing the gridded cool stuff, um, he was incredible and he'd make like th things that were just super photorealistic. Um, if you're ever bored and you want to see like epic photorealism, check out Chuck Close. I'm sure Dee you've checked out Cl Chuck Close, but um, so please do not interpret what I was saying as trash and photorealism. The other way, excuse me. It'll be interesting to see where else he goes. I can't read my own freaking writing here. <laughs> um, the other way to do it is to just systematically keep breaking rules. That's because good, good what happens too. is, is that you have a standard practice. Every work of art that anybody notices deviates from standard practice. Now, some of these deviations are selected as good deviations. Do you understand? And so they become integrated into standard practice, these second level deviations. And then everything deviates again. Some of those are integrated into standard practice and they are integrated with the first and second generation into standard practice. And things keep changing. And they keep changing because art must change. Because if it doesn't change, it is nothing. Now, as artists, some of you, I think, are artists. Your clothes are not very good. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not a fashion show. Uh, should be. Um, but uh, anyway, the point, the point that I'm making here is that if this is a Darwinian progression of sort of standard deviation, uh, functional deviation, integration, deviation, integration. It goes on and on. That's the way art changes. And it changes more rapidly, of course, than it does in animals because a perfectly normal field mouse is a perfectly ordinary field mouse. It does all the field mouse shit you want it to. <laughs> a perfectly ordinary work of art disappears. It's not there. You know, it's on the radio. You know, it's something like that. So the pressure to develop is a lot, a lot more in art. Now, how can I get out of this? So, so you use, no, I mean, I'm, 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 I had a, a Okay, let me, my, my point, which I'm trying to sort of wheedle around to, is that somebody probably, if I didn't say this, would say, are you saying it's the survival of the fittest? And I say, no, people who say that don't know about Darwin. Because in Darwin, it's the survival of the luckiest. You know, it is whoever is lucky. I had a friend of mine who was into Darwin things, and, 
who talks about the red-tailed hawk. And evidently over thousands of years, the red-tailed hawk generated this back spur. It was a totally, you know, there's a hawk like this, it's got this back spur, it's almost like a thumb, you know? And, uh, and so over the years, this, this, this back spur from its vestigial till its fully developed uh, point, enormously helpful in being a predator. You know, it makes you could you could not just hook things; you could grab things, right? So, those hawks were lucky. That's interesting. It's like I, I think it's probably a good thing if you're talking to like a school of art kind of thing, because it's like especially you know you're gonna have like a lot of people who are like kind of developing their foundations and stuff like that, and it's like encouraging them to kind of push beyond that and you know start kind of thinking <laughs> um, a little bit beyond just the technique is, is probably a healthy thing for like, especially if you're talking to people who are like trying for gallery shows and stuff like that. Um, let's continue. And the question I ask you is Clint Eastwood might say, do you feel lucky? <laughs> Sorry. I just made that up. Uh, I didn't, I didn't plan to quote Clint Eastwood. Um, uh, but my, my point is, is that uh, tell you what luck is. Uh, luck is uh, Ed Ruscha meeting Andy Warhol or Jasper Johns meeting Roy Lichtenstein and all of these guys who have been progressing on their own in their studios suddenly discover they have something in common. They have a gang that somewhere from someone in the complexities of deviation and, 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 and assimilation, all of a sudden you have all these guys who have sort of a definable descent from what came before. That's not theory. That's not brains. That's lucky. Do, do you understand what I mean? And most of the artists I know who have survived, except for Josiah, of course, who did it all on brains. Uh, where are you, Josiah? Okay, he's probably squinching down. Um, are lucky. You know, they find that place in the past. They find that place in the, uh, the present. They find that argument with their predecessors that convinces everyone. But I promise you, you can't tell if you got it. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's why I really discourage people who haven't sold, who have sold less than a hundred works of art. I discourage them from calling themselves artists because artist is not one of those names you take onto yourself. It is a name that is assigned to yourself when you actually make some art. Now, if we applied this rule to architects, the entire architecture establishment would collapse. <laughs> because uh, I only know about a thousand architects for one that makes a building. But it's a pretty good idea. And so what I'm saying is uh, this rewards capital is everything in the art world. It re rewards persistence. Uh, it rewards Mostly, if I, if I were to say what the sort of format that I'm pre presenting to you rewards most is that it rewards a steady temperament. And uh, I was having dinner with my friend Tim Bavington and uh, Wolfram Putz, who's a German architect who was one of my students at Cy Oregon. And of all... Okay, guys, we are at about the two hour mark, so we're probably going to take a break. I did notice I've lost a few people, so this is this is an interesting thing. I think part of it is because it's late, and I think part of it is because art theory is weird. <laughs> and also, honestly, like here's the thing: when you like, I, I experience this too, um, especially with art theory, where um, so the the thing that's interesting is like if I listen to like theory and it's people talking about like physics, it's easier to kind of have distance to it. Cause man, I'm not a physicist. I don't know. You know, <laughs> like, so I'm not as attached to it, but when, when you start hearing things about art or somebody saying, Hey, this stuff's not art or this stuff is art. And it starts getting into these heavy conversations. 
it's hard not to take it like super personal because it's like, wait a minute, like I do art. Like I call myself an artist. How dare you say I can't? And um, that's going to naturally happen the second you listen to anyone talk about the philosophy of art or what is art. Um, so these are hard conversations, um, even with like the kind of light delivery that Dave Hickey gives. And so I can definitely see that. Um, Philip said, uh, it's okay. There's a couple of issues he's editing. Uh, oh, waiting. to. Oh, sorry. He said, sorry, responding to Adam. I'm still listening to what you're saying. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. Oh, wait, I was way behind. Okay. So what do we got? Oh, I think that's it. Okay. So, um, I will be right back. We're going to do a trailer. Um, this one, I think I'll play two stories. You guys, I just want to point out where we're at on this page. We're here and, uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So we're, we're almost to the point of what I needed to get done tonight, getting done on page 74. So we're going to do the rest of the panel borders after this break. And then we'll probably, um, play a game of risk and try to take over the world, which is kind of exciting. Yes, uh, in a game. But uh, okay, so let's play the trailer. Um, for let's see here, I think I'll play this one. Hi, my name's Chris, and I like comics. I want to talk about this comic for a second here. I just got this in. I ordered it direct from my local comic shop through Diamond Distributing. It's Joshua Campbell's Jacob's Apartment. I really enjoyed this book. There's all kinds of comics out there, let's be honest. There's fun comics, there's superhero comics, there's young adult comics, there's adventure comics for kids. There's so many different things under the planet. But there's also an entire subgenre of alternative books. Real life, real world depictions in comic book form. Situations that happen to each and every one of us. And this is a fine example of that. If you get a chance, order this book local comic shop. You won't be disappointed. I can't sing its praises high enough. Okay? Check it out. Check his apartment by Joshua Kemble. Okay, so um, that was pretty good, and uh, um, that was an awesome trailer. I'm a little loopy and sleepy. I gotta explain why that is um, real quick before we we start wrapping up the art and uh, the bit of this. I don't know if we're going to get through the full lecture, um, but that's okay. Um, it's Dave Hickey, the God. Oh my gosh. I'm already forgetting how to pronounce. Oh, and way <laughs> on we that's it on we um, by uh, Dave Hickey. And it's on the school of visual arts uh, YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to watch it without my commentary and stuff like that, that's where you'd find it. But before kind of getting back into it, um, I am exhausted because uh, I went straight from work. Um, I usually work really late in the night. So what I'll do is like I'll get home. Um, I have a long commute, so I'll like eat food either on the way or like eat food when I get home. But like I've gotten home at the point where I wouldn't expect like my son and my wife to have had to like wait to eat. Um, so I, I power eat some food and then usually I take a quick nap while Ben's doing homework and his bath and then I'll wake up and, um, and this is just a pattern to kind of get through this book on top of my day job. Um, then I'll wake up, read books to my son and kind of get like once he's in bed and stuff, like kind of get to work. Um, again, like often late in the night till about two in the morning or something like that. Um, but that got thrown for a loop in a good way where, um, my son had an open house. So I left work a little early and we, we went to the open house at his school and it was awesome. Um, he's like building these cool dioramas and we got to see a lot of like his art and stuff like that. And it was so exciting to kind of see this, this young creativity. Um, and not only that, like, um, he is so good at math. I can't believe it. Like, there's this math game they play play in the class. My son is not that old. Um, and there's this math game they play. It's like almost like a bingo game, but you have to do really quick um, multiplication 
to kind of like mark your spot and, and get four in a row. So it's like a mix of like bingo and um, connect four, but with like math equations. And um, I, I'm, so I get back from work, I'm pretty exhausted. <laughs> And then this like massive task switch when we're like trying to play this bingo game. I'm like, dude, I don't know these multiplication things that you're just firing off. Like, I don't know. Them. My son's just like getting the answers instantly. I'm like, we're, we're going to be so screwed when he gets to, when he gets to algebra, he's going to be so disappointed <laughs> in his dad. Cause I'm, I'm really bad at math. Um, and especially when I'm tired, it's like, I just, my brain was like, I cannot do math equations. <laughs> and meanwhile, like my wife and my son are just like, boom, 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 boom. And like game over four in a row. Um, it was kind of fun, but I was so proud of him. And like, it was really fun to see. Um, it's interesting. The one thing that's fascinating about like parenting, um, as weird as that is, is like you have like these weird moments of like seeing windows into your kid's life at school. Um, and so it's like this weird thing where it's like, you kind of see them progress in school. You get these little snapshots of what's happening at school, but there's this whole world of their life that you aren't present in. And you kind of get these glimpses or these occasional conversations about it. But often like at Ben's age, he's like way more interested in kind of playing and like talking about the things he loves and stuff like that. So like getting him to open up about like, what happened at school today and stuff like that can be really like, um, like this, you're, you're sol solving this mysterious puzzle of like this whole part, uh, secret part of your kid's life, which is weird. Cause you know, when you got a kid, it's like, you're used to kind of knowing everything about their life for like a good chunk of the, the beginning. And so it's interesting adjusting to that, but back to schools are always fun. Cause it's like, okay, here's a good snapshot of like what's happening. Um, and also it's fun to see like the progress educationally that they're getting, you know, so he's learning like structures of like how to build kind of arguments and um, uh, really learning math and like doing a lot of creative drawing and like crafts and like creative writing, which is really fun. So there's like a cool story you wrote about a dragon. Um, all of that happened uh, before I got home. But by the time I got home, it's like there was, there, we're not, able so it's like the, the routine can't happen which so really rewarding day but again like today i am um, a little little sleepy okay let's continue i know that's fun to hear on a vlog how sleepy the host is <laughs> okay uh here we go we'll we'll continue the lecture and finish up this page and then we'll play a game of risk and call it a day on the stream but thanks uh to anybody watching i appreciate it all my students at this time, they were about three years out of school. They were doing the best. They were making a lot of money. They were kind of bright young things. And uh, so we're having lunch at Spago. And, uh, and I'm thinking, what is it about these guys? It, what do they have in common that would allow them to succeed so effortlessly? And uh, I came up with two answers. First, they're both gregarious. In other words, they like to get along with people. Second, I had never seen, seen either one of them in a bad mood. In other words, steady as you go, this is our job. Now, your problem is that you came through, a lot of you, and I'm sorry for you because I did too, uh, came through American primary and secondary schools. Now, American primary and secondary schools has its own form of self-selection. If you are bipolar, you go into the arts. If you are dyslectic, you go into the arts. If you have short attention span, you go into the arts. If you are morbidly obese, obese, you go into the arts. And so what you have basically going into the arts in college is a bunch of people who haven't got a freaking prayer of even working in a service station, not much being an artist, because all these people are shunted over there. And I can honestly say that I have known a lot of artists, and I would say that a steady temperament is probably the most powerful instrument 
I would probably say of all the artists I know, it is those who are bipolar who suffer the most horrifically. I mean, it is just awful. But also, all of this shit is a con job. Do you understand? Supply side economics is conning you into going out there and buying a lottery ticket out of which you have one chance in a billion to win. You know, and you're mortgaging your dad's service station to do it, or whatever your dad has. Um, your mom's service station. She would be a sexist. Um, but uh, but what, I, what I'm saying is that it really is luck. And so I felt a lot better about the art world when no one was encouraged. You know, mm. when, the, when the ladies in the fancy dresses didn't come by and, oh, it's just, oh, I just think it's so wonderful. I've met this young Israeli artist and he's living out in Brooklyn and I really think it's like, Jesus. Um, so, but my, my point is, is that, you know, you have to understand patronage has its price. It is about the inadequacies of the patron. It means somebody didn't give mommy a big hug. It means, you know, it means somebody who's totally incompetent and non-creative likes to put creative people under their thumb. It means any number of things. Somebody likes to show off to their friends. There are all these reasons. None of them have to do with art because none of these people know about art. Hmm. And the selection process is not random, but it's pretty damn close it's a survival of the luckiest so if you feel lucky and you're not bipolar uh like me <laughs> i'm not bipolar <laughs> i'm just getting smaller oh <laughs> uh, anyway <laughs> yeah well you can't see uh, that was that was a, an inappropriate joke but uh also, I should point out here, I would like to conclude with this, but also I'd point out that that only Jerry and Roberta get to sit in the talk from the middle right there. And so uh, I'm over here on the side. And uh, and uh, Levi Strauss, when he talks, he probably talks from the other side. But Jerry, right out there, right out there. So um, anyway, that's my little talk. And... Uh, and the one thing I think it, it helps is just think about this statistically. Think about the number of people. Think about the number of people in each subgenre. There's my new favorite subgenre is the genre of five foot square paintings that either look like a bundle of laundry or a laundress in distress. You know, I don't know if you see, I see these in Brooklyn all the time. Uh, but so start subcategorizing them and perhaps find that category where the competition is the weakest kind of move, move in that direction. And uh, but, you know, that is I want to say the good part is and the good part is if you want to be an artist, then obviously it's easy for you and you want to do something that's easy for you. And obviously, it's fun for you. And you want to do something that's fun. You're going to have to do it your whole life. It's not like you, you don't have years to waste, you know, with your wrist pressed to your forehead. You know, there is a, you, you, you want to be able to work and you want to be able to be happy. And you want to be able to not have to go to work. And all of these are wonderful goals. And with small exceptions, I have achieved them at various times. And I can tell you that they're wonderful goals. But that required being lucky, you know. In my experience, as David said in his introduction, uh, I'm standing here today because about 10 of the young critics who were about to snatch the torch from my failing grasp died of AIDS in the 80s. I can think of 10 easily. The first rate critics, they're all gone. I'm still here. Not only that, I had the, actually this is Richard Sarah and I, 
got we're having a conversation. I had a pause. We, this. we so I'm sure this has like an intriguing ending. I do love the focus on luck. I, this kind of reminds me a bit of like. It's, it's actually interesting. This has taken a turn that I think is really fascinating. And I'm sure it ends on a bit of encouragement. But um, so I would encourage you guys to check that out. I hate ending it on a down note because it's kind of ruining the intention of the um, the flow of where he's heading. But what I'm what I'm getting from this is kind of the vibe I got. Um, I've talked about the Chris Ware lecture I saw a long time ago where he just talked about like you're going to kind of hate comics right and he kind of talked about it like to people who were aspiring or wanting to make comics and at the end of it like he just talked about like how horrible it is and how everybody hates it and hates the process and stuff like that but he ended it with saying like but like the cool thing is like i'm only saying that because if you're in it and you're hating the process right like you're not alone like that's that's the process like um and he was like, I just say that so that like, because if you're going to do comics, like that's not going to stop you like that, like you're already interested, you're already going to do it. And um, it, it was encouraging to hear because I was at the time I heard that it was like I was struggling through my first comic and it was like, I felt like this lunatic. I was like, why is this like not fun? <laughs> like, you know, I like the result, but it's not fun. Like this kind of sucks. Um and hearing somebody say, no, 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 like you're actually, you know, because like the whole time when you're first really taking it seriously, it's like, am I doing this right? You know, like and uh, to hear somebody say that it was like really encouraging because it's like, OK, that's actually like a common thing. Um, I think for somebody to give the realities, especially because you got to think like, you know, Dave Hickey primarily is writing for like art with a capital A, which I think is silly to capitalize art with an A anyway. Um, people who are like trying to make a living doing like gallery art and like in the high art world. Right. And, um, or I should say the high art world, right. Um, being a low artist myself, which honestly, I proudly am happy to be a low artist. <laughs> like I'll, I'll aspire to do really good stories and, you know, make something great, but like, I don't need the like capital in my a for art. I think it's silly. Um, comics are way better anyway. They're catering to way less pretentious people. But, um, but because of that, like it, 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 what he's saying is not off. Like it's, it's good for people who are going to like aspire to make a living as an artist to like come at it from like a, like, or even a commercial artist, right. To come at it from the perspective of like, it is really hard and there is a ton of luck involved in the process. And, um, he was kind of talking about like stick to itiveness, which I think is really interesting. Um, so I'm sure that he's probably going to wrap with something along the lines of, you know, being in it for the long haul and not chasing trends. And, uh, like, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the gist <laughs> and then being okay with the fact that like, yeah, some of it's luck, like some of it has nothing to do with skill or like dedication or anything. Um, you know, and. Uh, I think Corey's talked about this where it's like luck is opportunity meets effort. So it's like without the effort and without making the stuff that luck will never occur. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting and it's a, it's a little dark, but at the same time, really, um, <sighs> I don't know. It's pretty interesting. I'm kind of curious to see how it wraps. So maybe I'll watch this later on my own, but Right now, we have finished what I needed to do to stay on task with this comic. And so what we're going to do is play a game of Risk. So we will close this out. We'll play one last trailer, and then we will get into our Risk game. Um, let me know what you think. Did this piss you guys off? Did it make you think? Was it interesting? Do you like Dave Hickey? I would recommend check out Air Guitar. That gets more into like his philosophy of beauty. And uh, I actually cited a lot of his stuff when I had to write my thesis to justify comics, which is funny because, again, like I'm not I'm not doing the gallery stuff, <laughs> but but uh, but he has like some really interesting takes on the pursuit of beauty and like um, just like the process of art making in itself. And so I don't want you guys to think he's just like this cynical old guy who's like, you're all going to fail. Um, but I do like that he speaks very honestly 
and very from the cuff. And uh, I don't know. He's a funny guy. Um, Dave Hickey, everybody. That was pretty cool. All right. So we're going to do, but I'd love to hear what you think in the chats. Um, and like, yeah, honestly, it, did it make you mad? Did it make you happy? It, did it give you a reaction? Because like that to me is a pretty good sign. Like if it, if, if it was just kind of boring, that's not the best sign. <laughs> All right. Um, let's do, uh, let's do the trailer for, uh, let's see here. Which one haven't I played? I can't even remember. Okay. Oh yeah. The trailer, uh, for two stories. This is a Christmas trailer, um, for my book, two stories. And when I come back, let's go back. Let's actually get things prepped before we do that. So you guys, you guys have, do not have to wait. So. I'm going to put on my setup for, um, okay. So I'm going to put on my setup for the live stream when we play risk. And when I come back, we will rock and roll some risk. So here is that trailer. All right. So we just uh, saw a little bit of Dave Hickey uh, talking about some high art stuff. We're going to go ahead and close that out. That was interesting. Um, maybe we'll pursue another lecture like him talking about beauty or something like that. But I like it. He's very Hunter S. Thompson ish. <laughs> Like he pisses people off, which is kind of fun. Um, but yeah, uh, okay. And again, like I put people on here that I don't fully agree with. Um, like I think that's really interesting. <laughs> um, but honestly, it was good advice, um, especially if you're pursuing that realm of art. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and play our game of Risk. Um, I have lost so much ranking in this game. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm very lowly ranked now. I'm among the lowly ranked. I got all high on my high horse with my smugness. <laughs> and then uh, got beat pretty bad in quite a few games. Um, but I'm still on this journey where I'm attempting. And also, the other thing I've realized about the FFA games is the rankings are seasonal. And so that's a really interesting thing. So you kind of reset, like you kind of restart um, as it goes. But still, <laughs> um, I'm still on this kick of really digging the um, the progressive uh, fixed games um, because they go a little quicker. And so when it's like late in the night like this, because of the exponential thing that happens in the progressive games, um, I'm interested in kind of seeing that happen. And by the way, like, um, 
he wasn't wrong about like people aren't buying art like like it, it it was a really good point cuz like i often will get frustrated when i see people just buying like you know like capes and tights kind of comics um which by the way i buy some capes and tights comics but the fact that that's like especially ones that are like derivative like they're they're comics that like are like batman with a different costume and like part of that is just because people are, aren't buying that because of the artist necessarily. They're buying that because it makes them feel good or like, you know, validates their thing or it feeds them more of what they like, you know, <laughs> like, and so like, that's a reality of the industry. A lot of what I do at my day job um, are, are like things that are feeding, you know, customers what they want um, or like pre thinking, like what is something that they'll want next year. Um, and so like, on a commercial end, um, his advice is not bad, like at all. It's it's not fun, but it's it's not bad. <laughs> um, okay, let's do this. Uh, okay, we got a progressive game. We're gonna join it, and Jordan the snooty in there. That's my player. We're getting the good luck. Oh, I was going to give a little meme there for them, but we're not. So as I play Risk, um, for those of you who don't know, I have this little side project of trying to become a grandmaster at Risk, which I'm further and further away from. Um, but I am also weirdly persistent. Um, and so I like to play this in the attempt at getting better and better at it. Um, OK, so it's a progressive game. And uh, I'll just walk you guys through what's occurring. So in progressive games, it's a little less about territory than like a fixed game because your big thing is the card bonus and being in a position where you can annihilate other players um, once you're, once you're kind of cards have cashed in. So it's a little bit more luck, less skill than the fixed games, um, but it is fascinating and there is a technique to it too. But a lot of it also has to do with the order um that you appear in i do have early advantage which is cool like i'm on third here in third position um so we'll see how this winds up oh wait i thought i was black never mind i'm in last position so uh, the only advantage i get here um is seeing where everybody's heading so red it looks like actually it's hard to figure out what red was thinking um, but I think Red is aiming for South America, but just ate a lot of troops on their turn. Black is not really heading in a specific territory. I think they're trying to stay spread out. Um, but they want to keep their five like right above Australia so that they can kind of like, I think they have their eyes on Australia a little bit. But they don't want to buffer up too much because you want to keep like your primary troops. It is weird that black is not making a move. That's a little concerning. I'm, I'm hoping they didn't like bot out and quit the game. That can also be like a sign of like somebody playing two accounts, which is a little disturbing. So I hope that's not the case. Because that's a weird long wait to do. Maybe their connections interrupted or something. Okay, so Black is going to try to make a play to be in Australia. And annoyingly, like, kind of hit some of my troops. But that's okay. I get a big card advantage at the end. So hopefully I last the first rounds, but... Um, because I'm last to go, so yellow is really spreading themselves out. Um, this is a weird game. Like nobody's aiming for big stacks. That's a little strange. But it looks like yellow is going to make a play to try to kind of have their hub be in Europe. So far, I haven't lost as many troops as purple, but I get a bigger um, troop count for being sixth, which is good. That's the nice thing about this game. Like if you're in sixth place, sixth position's rough because everybody's kind of moved on the board, but the one advantage is you know where everybody's going. Um, 
and also the fact that you get like more troops in your turn. I don't like that seven right above my three because right now that three could be valuable, but I'm not sure where that seven's going to go. It's a weird position to buffer up in. So blue, I think is, yeah, it's hard to know what blue is doing. I think blue is trying to hold their ground in Europe. So blue might make a slow play for Europe, but also everybody at this point is pretty cautious to make a move in Australia because there's a lot of stacks there that could knock each other out. Purple is definitely going for South America. Red is in a really rough position. Red only has eight troops. <laughs> That's pretty brutal this early in the game. I feel really bad for red. I don't know if red's going to last the next turn, but if somebody wipes red out this early, they also put themselves at a big disadvantage. Um, here, I think what I want to do is create an exterior position. I think that seven is going to try to move into my five on the next turn. So I think my best play might be to buff up. I want to get out of Europe, but I'm not in a place to do it. But I want to save that five. I'm wondering if it is salvageable. So I think that's what I do is I think what I'll do is buff up my. Um, I should probably hit that seven, but I'm just going to let that seven go till I have a card turn in. Um, and then I'm just going to buff up my. Uh, thing to like I probably would have been better just not taking a card at that point but at this point I just want to make a big stack since I'm last and it looks like everybody's kind of got a rough idea of a territory the only ter territory I think that if I'm going to play a territory game even though it's a progressive one would be somehow getting to Africa I'm not going to make a play when you got a six and a seven in Europe because like they might be in contention. I want to let that seven move over if I'm going to make any move for Europe. Um, but I think my best bet is actually to kind of move into um, Asia and just kind of chill and make a big stack and then try to kind of take out people once I get big enough. But that means I need to make a slow play to like start moving my troops elsewhere. I'm really concerned about the lag that every player is using in this game, it makes me think there might be alt, alt players. Um, but maybe not. Because, again, you also want to really think, where are you buffing up troops? I also don't like that red's there. Like, what's your purpose there, dude? So now I'm in a position where I have to hit red and lose troops? <laughs> I don't know what red's trying to do. Red is pretty screwed, though. And I'm in a pretty good kill position to red. The only problem is I can't take out red at a card turn in to get their cards later on mainly because red's got that three just chilling in um in australia so what i'm hoping is maybe somebody goes at red pretty hard black is trying to spread out it looks like they're almost trying to take asia which is interesting i think they want to be in as many places as they can be for the card turn in but they're also really spreading themselves pretty thin. It's a strategy, I guess. Yellow is starting to consolidate Africa, but they're losing a lot of important troops to do so. Um, but it might be a worthwhile effort. The only problem is they're going to have threats from purple once purple cashes in. They probably, I would say, like, I wouldn't have personally expended that many troops. But they have 20, so they're in a decent place. They're in a better spot currently than I am. So the spread out and just kind of very aggressive approach of yellow might be paying off. The, wor the worst position right now is red. It can still turn around, though, in a progressive game. That's the fun thing about playing risk progressive. But... If red gets to the point where they have three cards, at that point, they're going to become prey. I don't know if I want to be the first person to take out red, even if I was in full position to do it. Because 
often you want to be strategic about when you're going to strike. Um, because like in progressive, if you're going to hit somebody, you want to kind of take them out entirely and get their cards and then be able to cycle that into the next big takeout or at least have that give you such a boost that you're impossible to take out on the next turn. Quite often in progressive, somebody will expend so many troops taking out somebody for their cards that their bonus, because the bonus is ex exponentially increased with cards, um, their bonus doesn't give them enough troops to not make somebody hit them immediately after and take their cards. So it's, it's, that's the catch, is you don't want to expend too many troops in taking out a person. You want to be at a point where you can take out um, people's troops. So for me, it's like, again, I'm no expert in this, but I prefer to start really taking people out like five turns in if I'm in a position to do so, if I've lasted the culling <laughs> that is progressive. Ooh, I hope... Okay, they moved. They moved. This is good. I can start making my way very slowly um, out of the way. So I think what I'll do here. Oh, can I take out red? Is it worth it for two cards? It's probably not worth it for two cards at this point. I need to let red actually kind of get a little bigger. That might be something I regret later, but my goal is still trying to kind of keep an eye on Asia. I could have taken out red entirely. Um, that would give me a slight advantage, but if I can do it after a card turn in myself, that would be the ideal. So I'm keeping an eye on red. I kind of want to stay in the neighborhood. Um, red is <laughs> just obnoxiously like eating my cards. Like I almost want to get those cards from red, but red is also lined up to where I think if anybody gets red's cards at this point, it's probably purple. But I might be lucky enough to be in the position to take out red for their cards on the next turn if no one else beats me to it. I'm also hoping my four and my three don't get eaten. And, ooh, that was brutal. So black is making some weird plays. <laughs> They're like, I, like, it's hard to not think there's like alternate players on this, but I think they're just new players or something. <laughs> Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's a brilliant strategy, but spreading yourself really thin so that when they start getting bonuses, like they're not starting from a great point. Spreading yourself out with that many ones makes you a really easy, easy target. Let's see. So where is red at? They have 10. I'm in a bad position because of that move by black, who also put themselves in a really bad position. It was a weird move. Like, so I'm now, I'm now tied like second to last because of black hitting that three for no reason and leaving themselves really vulnerable for blue. Blue's in a pretty good position. Blue's actually doing really well um, and playing fairly well. Like you wanna be a little conservative at first. But what I do like is I think I can move up, if not take out red. And red would lead to a cash in, but it would only be four troops. It's gonna it would cost ten troops, so that would leave me with like five troops plus four. So I'd be at like nine troops. So I'll get eaten immediately if I go for the bait of red. I shouldn't go for red. I think I have to wait till turn five, ideally. It's really tempting though, right? Like in this game, you do get cards for taking somebody out, but. And if I kill red, I do get a cash in. But at this point, the exponential growth hasn't kicked in. So I actually would get punished for that. Um, I really don't like <laughs> the position I'm in. Um, and it's funny. I feel like these people who are being really bold and a little too aggressive are almost like getting rewarded for it, which is a little frustrating. 
But now I have a nice 13, and I'm still technically in a kind of kill position. Red is in a really bad spot. If red doesn't have a card turn in this next turn, uh, purple or blue totally annihilate red, because I just made it really easy for another player to do that and get a double turn in. So I'm going to see if I later regret letting red live. <laughs> So I'm in a position to do a card turn in on the next turn. Um, I need to measure that very carefully because if I turn in right now, I'd go from 13 to 17. And that's not necessarily good. What is black doing? Black is definitely trying like a scattershot theory. Um, and so far it's actually the attempts working OK. The problem is everybody's set up to get, like, so purple is going to, it's hard to think that these players aren't just like setting themselves up for purple to just do a tirade. <laughs> Cause purple now has two territories. Nobody's broken them and they have three cards. So if they have a card turn in, in theory with their bonus, they could sweep through, take out black, take out red, take the whole board. That's dangerous. I don't know if they have enough. But it does feel like it's almost like being set up for that. So that's the catch is like, I need to be the first, like, even if they're alt players or something for purple, um, I need to be in a place where I can actively take these people out at a card turn in. And now I'm out of play with red. And it looks like um, blue is going to go for the kill next turn. But that's okay, because even if I hit red right now, like let's say purple takes out red, gets those cards. They're only getting four cards for this effort and significantly weakening themselves. Now, that gives them a card advantage, but they're in a position where now they have to turn in. But they do have the advantage of having two extra cards, which gives them a huge advantage next, next turn if they last through the cycle. So that's the catch is like this purple. So red is eliminated. We kind of knew that was going to happen. I'm glad I wasn't the person to do it. <laughs> um, purple is a threat right now. That They are the board lead at this point in the game. But again, they're very spread out. I'm in a very dangerous position too. My question is, do I turn in now that I get a six troop bonus? Um, lining up purple to just dominate? Or do I wait? Oh, man, I'm in a pretty deathly position here. How many troops does black have? Can I make that happen? 16 minus 6, and we'll see what happens. 24, can I take out 16? I think I can. They have four cards. I might get killed on my next turn. This is kind of a dumb move to take out black. But it's so tempting. <laughs> this might be why I lost rank recently. It's so tempting. I hope I don't get killed on my next turn for this decision. I might. Oh, man, I weakened myself so bad. Oh, and I didn't get five. I'm dead next turn. <laughs> I'm definitely dead next turn. Um, where can I move where I'm hard to kill? I need to move. Uh, he, uh, that gives me purple territory. I need to move somewhere like. Yeah, I'm going to die next turn. Because now I have five cards and I have 21 troops. So I acted too soon. I fell for the bait. That's the fun thing about um, progressive is like it's all about having the right timing. And I knew in my gut I shouldn't hit red. It's just it was there for the taking, you know. 
Um, and now I'm going to get chewed away. I think purple takes me out. Or let's see, what's the next turn in? So they're going to get eight. So blue's in the best position to take me out. They're going to get eight. They're at 21. I'm at 20. So they're already in position to completely wipe me off the board and get five cards for it. So I think I just accidentally gave the game to blue. I don't... I, I mean, in theory, um, purple might be in position to do that, but because they were first to attack and they expended their, themselves a little too much, and blue wisely, unlike myself, was very reserved, I should have waited a turn. Um, unless blue doesn't have a turn in. Oh, they're going to wait for five. I might last. We'll see. Oh, blue's not going to act. Oh, that makes me so happy. Oh, you guys, I have a pretty big advantage here. So I have a card turn in this next turn if um, purple doesn't take me out. Purple might take me out. They might be in position to do so. I don't know. I, I, think, I think they can. Because they're also accruing a lot of cards for those two territories. So I think purple takes me out of the game here. 21, can that? Yeah, it's going to happen. And they'll get five cards, game over. They'll cycle that to the whole board. Well played, Purple. Very well played. I made that fatal error of taking the bait and going for red, even though I knew this would happen. Oh, what a bummer. They have 17, I have 16. They can use that six and stuff. Totally expend me out. I'd be surprised. Uh, so they're going to use their eight too. Yeah. Yeah. They're coming for me. If they let me live, that's insane. <laughs> They've taken three territories. So maybe they think it's about territories. Um, so blue is totally lined up to completely wipe me off the map. Um, purple is asking to be invaded or killed by someone. So I think what I do is let them accrue cards um, and hope that these aren't alternate players and hope they focus their resources on trying to stop purple because I'm in no position to do that after the cost I paid to get that stupid bonus. I shouldn't have taken out red there. And to be honest, purple should have taken me out. I now only have three cards to offer. Yeah, this is going to be yellow saying, how dare you take two territories, dude. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Purple is still in a solid position because uh, nobody has broken. Um, but let's see what blue gets next. So this is a distraction. Blue could totally take me out of the game and get three cards. Um, so they could do a double cash in. So this might be blues game at this point. If they choose to take me out, roll that into taking purple out and then roll that into taking yellow out. They may not want to move this early, but that's possible at this point. And that's exactly what they're going to do. So goodbye in the sense of I am out of this game, unless they're going to, I think they're going to take me out. I'm shocked if they don't take my cards. Yeah, very well played. So blue is a really good player. Um, when this is over, I bet you blue is pretty high ranked because everybody else expended themselves looking for territories. Blue just kind of chilled. Oh, I hope they get me because they played this so well. That was bad. Why move that way? There you go. Okay, I want to watch the rest of this, though. That was all because I attacked red too early. Um so again, like I'm, I'm still learning on this. So I, yeah, they get a big card turning, but wrong enemy, wrong direction, dude. Take purple. Oh wait, you can't take purple, but you can break purple. Ooh, you know what? Blue might get annihilated by yellow. Yeah, progressive's such an interesting game. But I, so in the chess game that is progressive, my big misplay here that lost me the game was um, 
was acting one too early, even though my knowledge from playing this was like, this is going to get me killed. <laughs> that wasn't the time to take the risk, and I just couldn't couldn't help but take the bait. Okay, I'm going to um, put on another trailer. So we'll go back to our main sc uh, screen. I'm going to play another trailer and see if I can play a little better in a game of Progressive again, if there is one available. Um, so if you want, stick around, and then we'll probably call it a night after that. So here is the trailer for uh, the Wordzoid ad. This is by Jim Lujan, who has a great uh, YouTube channel himself, um, who made this awesome animation for me. So here, here we go. Well, Peter, since I'm such a big music fan, I'm going to have to go with Karen Carpenter. Oh, Stu, I'm sorry. That's the incorrect answer. Trish, what you got for us? I'm going to go with Kim Gordon. All right, let's check that answer. Kim Gordon, do we have a Kim Gordon? Yes, and that means you're our new Wordzoid champion, Trish. Dale, tell Trish what she's won. Trish, you've won a copy of Two Stories, a memoir of faith and mental illness. Handwritten, hand-drawn, and handed to you by artist and writer Joshua Campbell. But wait, that's not all. You've also won a copy of Jacob's Apartment, the story of a doomed romance. What happens when you take eternal sunshine out of the spotless mind and put it in a blender with Ghost World? You get Jacob's Apartment, written and illustrated by Joshua Kremble. Trish, thank you for playing Wordzoid. All right, great job, Trish. Um, I was told I was going to get a lifetime supply of paper towels. Okay, so let me put on my headphones. Ooh, sorry if that made a bump. Um, I'm going to put on my headphones again, and we're going to play one more game and try not to suck. <laughs> See if there's one available. Okay, so let's go back to our risk cam and do one last game before we call it a night. And progressive goes a lot quicker. It's just a game of patience at first and then striking at the right time. And unfortunately, I was like, like fell for the bait. <laughs> and I knew I was doing it when I did it. So next time, if you're watching this in chat, next time I'm like, I probably shouldn't move yet. This is going to get me killed. Just be like, yeah, trust your gut, dude. Don't move. There's times where not striking and second guessing is bad, but when your first instinct is pretty much like, yeah, this isn't like it looks good, but that'll like doing the math. You're just like, there's no way somebody lets me get away with that. I'm surprised I lasted the turn I did. Um, Cause that game could have probably been closed by purple at that point. Let's see if there's any progressive games. If not, we can make one with six players and see if we can kind of get people joining in. Okay, so I'm going to create a game. We're going to play next. I think I have everything set up for progressive. I think we're in pretty good standing, so that works. So what we'll do is hit play. And then I'm going to try to kind of populate it with six players and we'll see if it fills up. Sometimes a little trick to get players interested would be to add like, you know, I'm adding a bot. OK, so we got General Baptiste in there. So I'm going to add another bot. Wait, no, let's wait. So what I want to do is like slowly fill it up. And then we'll remove the bot and try to add a six player. If these people are down to chill and kind of wait. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and wait for like all six. We've got four. That could be an okay game, but. It's never as fun when you have only four. I also like this because I have my setting to where the um, the bots don't go to like autoplay. Like all that happens if somebody rage quits is just every turn they just add more troops. So they can become more like a barrier rather than an advantage. So 
So we got Osborne Taguchi from Israel. We got Spooky Gauntlet from France, and we got Derek, and we're good to go. Yay! We can start this game. It looks like, again, it's always hard to tell these games if there's an alt or not. You just kind of have to play around it. If you got to pay to play. So I don't think I have to hit I'm ready because I this is my lobby, uh, my game. And we'll see where we rank up. And next time that I have that gut feeling. So the computer took over um, for... We already had a rage quit, like not even a rage quit, just somebody who might be an alt player. Um, and they already quit out. So their turn, all that's going to happen is their bonus troops just add, um, but that those won't move. So nobody gets cards from taking out yellow, which is great because people who cheat with alts that they then have quit and they kind of work with the um, bot. Uh, don't get the advantage of that. I am black and I'm again in last position. I'm in pretty good shape in uh, Africa, but that will likely change with this move from um, white unless they make a movement towards Europe. If I'm white, I'm probably going to go go either Europe, probably, probably aim for Europe. Or just, I guess, build your stack, and then you can kind of take stuff when you get your bonus. Red might make a play for south and take out my threes, which is going to leave them decimated pretty badly. Or they just eat a one and leave their fours very wisely, or consolidate their fours to one. They are signaling, though, that they want uh, South America. South America is a good starting point, especially in progressive. Purple is really close to taking Africa. I don't like the fact that now my threes are blocked by that four, which is annoying because I could have consolidated those threes. Now is blue going to mess with my stuff? No, blue's moving to Europe. That's good. Okay. There's a couple things I want to consider. Like, can I save that those threes? Would it be of advantage to me to attack those fours? Um... I think my clearest move here is to get out of the way of red so that red can move their threes down into their territory and they're less likely to kind of eat away at mine and then allow uh, white an opportunity to leave um, I'm going to allow white an opportunity to get out of Africa, just kind of claiming Africa. We'll see if that claim sticks. Not that I'm trying to take all of Africa. At this point, again, it's about stacks and timing. Like, I need to remember my gut. So I'm allowing red to actually hit my one. Why? Because red's going to feel better about hitting my one. <laughs> They're going to eat my threes, but... There is a chance that in good faith, maybe they let my threes out. In this game, though, it's much more cutthroats. But I think that white will move out of Africa. But they might just be stubborn and just stick around there like assholes. <laughs> oh, perfect. They move out of Africa. That's good. So I can start making a play for Africa, but I have a big contesting of that. And I'm going to lose like about six troops in this turn. The question is, what does red end up with after hitting those troops? They can move their three down. It's a little early to take all of it, so maybe they just take one. But right there, now they're a little weakened. If they were just smart enough to move that five, like they wouldn't even have to lose troops to take out the three. They'd only have to hit a one. <laughs> but... 
again, I'm not in the strongest position here. I think I'm in last position at this point. And the next turn, they're going to close out South um, America, which I'm fine with. If they just move like that, so they're blocking my three in, so that's just going to cost them troops. Like, <laughs> it's one of those things of like, I don't understand the thinking, but again, like, what do I know? I've lost so much ranking recently. But to me, if I were playing, I would let that three out so you don't have to kill it. That's like part of why you want to be a good neighbor. But red is not going to be a good neighbor. So I don't know if consolidating. Africa is a great idea. I know that yellow is becoming a big barricade for anybody on that side. Um, I also know that like blue looks like they're almost like lining themselves up in a way. <sighs> Should I move my three? Okay, here's what we do. The three goes into the two because red didn't want to be a good neighbor. So I'm going to lose that three anyway. So let's see if we get a card from that and then we don't have to make a move at all. Okay, that sucks. We didn't get a card. But you know what? Whatever. <laughs> now I'm at 16 troops. I'm still a big target though because I'm only in one spot on the board. Kind of rough being in last position. I'm not necessarily playing this game the best. But I am learning. And that's half the fun. Like the Dave Hickey thing, right? Like a lot of it's like persistence too, in a weird way. You kind of can't get better at this stuff without kind of dedicating yourself to it. And I am having fun with it. It engages my mind. So, okay, we got purple. Purple has Australia. Pretty confidently held, but red is pretty aggressive. But red isn't idiotic. Like, red has kind of secured South America with, like, a small number of troops, and they have it in next turn. So very well done. And they still have spread across the board and a pretty good troop count. So I shouldn't be too critical of red. I think right now they're going to gradually try to move through. Um, I don't think they want to take South America yet. They want to line themselves up to take me out potentially. Blue is going to eat away and just leave their seven there like a pro. So now they have blues in a really good position because now they have two kill positions for card turn-ins. And they're definitely lined up to rock my world pretty soon. <laughs> um, I think I think I just kind of chill here. And look at what three cards I have. Okay, so I can't turn in on the next turn, which might be a good thing because it's only four cards. Um, but I might die pretty early in this game. This is a hard one to predict. And again, like I'm more familiar with fixed. Um, I'm less familiar with progressive. So that's a big reason I've dropped in ranking a bunch because <laughs> I'm kind of still learning the format of this. I thought I had it down a little bit and then got rocked in quite a few games. But it's intriguing, and I, I want to stay at it just to get a little better at it. So the thing I need to figure out um, is how do these players that spread out and go super aggressive avoid getting totally eaten? I need to pay more attention to like red and how they're playing. The other thing is why did red move to allow purple out? That's weird. They're trying to retain that four. Oh, I get it. Okay. So they're going to try to gradually move that four 
But red's in a pretty good spot too, because like once kill positions go, if they can retain that, they have three orientations on the board to kind of move from. I'm pretty limited with one. So that means like, let's say hypothetically, like purple was in position to get annihilated. Um, I have to move now through a 10 to get there, and there's no way I can be the player that does that. Red is making a slow play for North America now. I still am a little... I don't know. I'm interested in red and how this kind of outcome works because I feel like my gut is like they're playing way too aggressively, but maybe not. Because, um, again, like progressive is a little different, um, and it's all about exponential growth and striking at the right time. But I think I need to think like a cobra. <laughs> That's going to be my technique on this. And we'll see. The problem is like right now I'm hiding in my hole. If I hit that one that's really tempting to hit and don't move out of my hole, then I'm trapped and I've cut myself off from the ability to attack red. But at this point, I don't know if that's a bad thing to be cut off from. Let's see what's going on with blue. So right now I am in last position on the board for sure. Like I look like the fish as they call it. The fish is when you're like the weakest player and in risk, like they're going to carve at the weakest player. Let's see rankings right now. Who's in first? Who's on first? No, who they're there. No. Um, so right now it looks like purple is holding the lead. Purple has secured territory pretty early on. So they're in a pretty solid position. Um, we have, uh, we have blue and yellow tied for a second, which is hilarious because yellow is a bot. Yellow is not going to get happily eaten, so that's a good thing. That is a really good strategy on Blue's part to kind of hide among yellow. I think Blue might be in like one of the better positions here. Because Blue has lined themselves, although Purple is in a really good position to kill Blue at a card turn-in. And all they have to do is move through a one. So purple's in a really strong spot, especially, ooh, they are lining themselves up. So purple wants blues cards. <laughs> but purple turned in early. So equally, blue's in a pretty good position to rock purple's world. Actually, to rock my world as well. Red is... Um, not in the lead, but they don't have a lot of threats near them. The only thing about red is, again, blue's in a pretty good position to hit red if they want. White, I'm not sure what they're doing. White might have just cost themselves the game with this weird attack for no reason. And this is another one of those scenarios where now on my turn, my goal is going to be do not attack white for their cards. <laughs> if I do that, I am dead. <laughs> I am in a pretty tough position here because red has a 14 pointed directly in kill position to me, and they have five cards now. So... What am I going to do about that? What is blue going to do about that? Does blue turn in their cards? Probably not. Blue seems too smart to do that. And they're in a pretty strong position where it's going to be hard for anybody on the board to touch them. Purple expended their card cash in. So now I have to play this game of... Do I turn in early and take away the bait of five cards and get a lower 
turn in with that 14 that's guaranteed to be able to take me off the planet next turn. At least that disincentivizes that move and redirects. But is there anyone who's more juicy of a target than me when it comes to Red's turn? And there is because then I only have two cards. So we have purple as a much more enticing proposition, but I'm easier to kill than purple. So I think I'm dead next turn, like next turn red takes, unless the board moves significantly. But does red pay the cost for that? Because like, what's the bonus? That's the question, because if Man, this is a tough one. So I definitely think I've probably somehow misplayed my beginning. But I think at this point, I need to disincentivize the reason to attack me, which is my cards at this point. But that's still going to up their card caching. So like red could still um, come in and wipe me off the face of the planet. Now, if I wanted to, I could take out white, but I'm not going to do that because that's kind of the error I made last time. And like I said, I need to be a cobra, and we'll see if the cobra thing works. Right now, my biggest threat is red. Um, blue is a pretty significant threat, too, because 8 plus 14, but blue can't take me. Purple can't take me, so my big threat is red. Red, if they cash in and take me. But does red want to hit a 27 for two cards? That'd be a weird play. White cannot take me off. So I'm in a pretty good position, unless Red wants to really just cost themselves the game to take me off, which I get. I did on my last turn. So why I'm analyzing each player and, like, my threats and stuff around me is, like, it's a very analytical game. And again, I'm not the best at it, but I'm learning. And hopefully this is educational or helpful for you guys. Like, if you're a really seasoned player... Um, you can learn from my misplays. <laughs> and if you're a new player, you know, hopefully maybe some of the stuff I'm talking about will help. Although, again, like when it comes to progressive, I'm pretty new to this. So it's a completely new direction to take. So we're... we're uh, we're getting closer to like three hours on the stream, and this game will end very soon, pretty soon. Red is not dumb, and Red also didn't end up getting a really big bonus, so I think I made the right move. Because if I hadn't taken that bonus... Um, now, Red definitely has their eyes on me, and now they're moving into super kill position. Because they're like, okay, his next turn he's going to have three cards, so that's worth attacking. Red remains my biggest threat. Blue gets next turn. Well, that, at least red moving there kind of prevents me from getting killed by blue. Does anyone challenge red? Who's in position to challenge red? Blue kind of is, but I think blue... I have to say, like, one of the things I'm really admiring about Blue's gameplay right now is the idea to hedge themselves among the robot um, that isn't active because it has nobody has any incentive to move through all those big hits on their troops for no cards. So they're playing the terrain really well. But I think... Red is going to kill me next turn, unless blue hits red. And blue has no reason to hit red, because blue needs to be strong. 
purple is in an interesting position. And purple would be in a stronger position if the robot was actually active. But the fact that the robot's not active has put purple in a bit of a pickle. Because purple has... <laughs> to move into Asia, purple's going to have to eat a big cost. Which will get smaller as the card bonuses increase. I am pretty much dead if red has a card cash in next turn. If those three cards that red has, when it gets to their turn, are... Ooh, and I'm in a rough position because I have to open up blue to take me out. And blue's in a really good position to take me out. I am dead next turn. <laughs> um, the only thing I can think, oh, it could be cool to expand out, but I think I just have to take the risk and make myself a pretty three cards that people can easily eat for three cards. So I am dead next turn. I was it's like check and mate kind of kind of scenario. So there is blood in the water and the sharks will annihilate me. Um, blue is gonna potentially go for it if red doesn't, because that's a worthy reason. You get fifteen troops if you kill me. But twenty nine for fifteen, is that a fair exchange? Do you want to do that yet, or do you want to wait till... Because I'm pretty much screwed anyway. Because <laughs> like, the, the card cashing didn't come. And I've put myself in a position where I can't attack. So they might be better to wait. White is just buffering up their troops. They didn't get a card. I think white might have just rage quit. That's strange. So this white Derek character, I think, is just doing might turn into a robot on the next turn because that, that was a weird move to not. Red did not take me off the planet. They are going to play the patient game because they're like, why? Why not? Interesting. They're abandoning it. Does blue take me out? Because blue's in position to do it. But again, do you want to pay 29 troops to get 15? That's a tough trade. So my gamble here, my snake, <laughs> has kept me alive for a bit. But the problem is the next turn, that return is going to be significantly better. It's already 20 now. So that's a much more high incentive to take a 29 hit. Because what do you lose, like 10 troops? but you gain 20. I mean, you're left with 10 troops, but you gain 20, so you're still in a better position. So blue kills me now. Should kill me now. Maybe blue wants me to accrue more cards my next turn. No, blue's going to wipe me off the planet. I'm shocked if they don't. Or are they going for purple? Because purple has four cards. Interesting. They get a better card return, and they take out purple, and they secure Australia. Very well played. Very well played. Oh, I wish I was in striking position, though. But... Very, very well played. And I remain somewhat safe. That was a really smart move. Who's going to challenge that? The only way red challenges that is if they card turn in. What's red's card turn in? They're going to get 25, so they could come at me pretty hard. I need to kind of get distance from red.
But does red go after blue, or do they just take America? That's interesting. Yeah, blue rage quit. That's weird. They surrendered? Seriously? Th there was no reason to surrender. That was a, a good... That was a really good play. I think I'm dead this next turn then. Because why would <clears throat> anyone... I Oh, well, maybe I'm not dead this next turn. This is a really weird game. Why would Blue surrender? They're not... They, they were in a pretty good space. I feel like that must be an alternate player. Like, why would they surrender and leave them at one? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> and then purple has 15. This is the weirdest game I have ever seen. It feels very strange. Red's in a solid place. I am in a really bad place because I have four cards, which is a real like tempting thing. Red, if they cash in, gets 30, and then they get 36, so they can take me out. And they get four cards for doing it. White is just not even playing. So it feels like some of these might have been alt players. It's just, it's hard to understand. Like there's no incentive to hit white. But what's weird is white's not a robot. So what's interesting is maybe white's trying to play a game where they just let the incentive disappear. The only thing that's cool here. Okay, I have a strategy, but it depends on whether red kills me. Can red kill me? Probably. Yep, I'm done. Game over. <laughs> that was two failed games, like heavily failed games of um, this. Yeah. So that'll do it, guys. I did awful on two games of Risk, but it was fun. And uh, that's OK. <laughs> OK, so um, hopefully you guys found this interesting. Let me know what you thought about Dave Hickey, uh, the thing we were listening to, um, whether you found that layout thing helpful at all, uh, whether you're liking my audio or you feel like the settings are kind of peaking. Um, and also just, uh, your thoughts. Um, you can even make fun of my bad play on risk cause I did not play well. <laughs> Still figuring out progressive. Um, all right guys, have a good night and I will see you on the next stream. Um, and who knows what we'll do. Um, I know that tomorrow's Friday and that should be really fun. So I'll try to do at minimum like a risk stream. Cause I think there is like off stream stuff I need to do. Um, but I will try to touch base with you guys tomorrow. So, all right, have a good night. And if you haven't yet, and you've watched this, please hit the like button, please hit the bell, please hit subscribes, um, the bell. So you get notifications when I'm about to go live. And last but not least, um, make sure you pick up Jacob's apartment and two stories. My two graphic novels that are currently out. It's a really good way to support indie comics. And if you care about art and indie stuff, uh, pick it up. And if you bought it and you enjoyed it, tell a friend. Uh, make it a goal to tell a friend. Um, thanks to everybody out there. Uh, I hope you guys got some productive work done. And uh, I'm really curious to hear what everybody's opinion of Dave Hickey is. Because, again, he's not an easy-to-digest figure. Um, I mean, he is a critic, right? But... Uh, but I like that. I like that he inspires like anger and inspiration in people. It's funny. It's like this mix, but he does piss people off sometimes. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts and stuff like that. And I will see you on the next live stream. Good night. Have a good art day. Bye.